to our guest, the Deputy Premier. Speaker, and I uh, want to welcome everyone to the chamber today. It looks like we have some EPSI members with us uh, in the chamber. And, and Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, recognize a group of young people watching online here. Uh, Mr. Michael Trainer's political science class is tuning in uh, today, and uh, we wish uh, they enjoy the proceedings here today. Also, Mr. Speaker, I want to point out the Central Storm are hosting the under-15 AAA female hockey championships in North Rustico this weekend, Mr. Speaker, and uh, looks like it's going to be a, a lot of exciting games out there, so I hope everybody gets out to, uh, to watch. And uh, tomorrow is April 19th, and UPI Faculty of Sustainable Design Engineering is holding its annual Student Design Expo and Awards Ceremony, so I wish everyone the best of luck in that. And... Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think setting day is coming up pretty soon, and uh, I know you have that probably marked on your calendar, but uh, I think on the north side, the 29th, and uh, for the south side, the 26th, so we wish all our fishers who are working hard to get our, their traps ready, the boats loaded, uh, a, a very successful week ahead. And uh, finally, Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate Alvin Keenan for... Uh, Receiving the Doug Kearney Award for Leadership and Excellence in Advancing the Interests of Canada's Agricultural Industry. That's a national award, and uh, Alvin, anyone who knows Alvin, is, yeah, he reminds me of my father. He's the salt of the earth kind of fella that everybody loves. And uh, I wish Alvin all the best and his, his team up at uh, Rolo Bay Farms a uh, successful growing season again. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise and welcome those who are watching online and those who are uh, in the gallery today uh, joining our proceedings. Um, we talked, or I did talk a lot, but the last few weeks about the activity in the wharfs across uh, Prince Edward Island. Uh, the uh, Deputy uh, Premier just spoke about, you know, April 29th being uh, on the north side, uh, the opening, and the 26th in the south. Uh, so there's a lot of activity in the wharfs, but there's also, I've seen today, uh, activity starting in the fields as uh, farmers are preparing, uh, preparing the soil for this year's season. So, And just uh, while I'm on my feet, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the Tignish area, uh, in celebration of National, National Film Day, the Tignish Co-op is inviting the public to join them this evening at the Tignish uh, Parish Centre to view a Canadian and a PEI classic and a Green Gable. So it's a great opportunity uh, for newcomers to the area to learn about our iconic um, and through the art of film, and also for the locals who may want to come out and, and enjoy that film also. Um, and then tomorrow evening at the Tignish Perry Centre, myself and the um, Members Relations Coordinator Paulette um, Doucette Arsenault are co-hosting an event uh, ending National Volunteer Week uh, by recognizing the many volunteers that belong to three of the quilting clubs in the area. And these three different quilting clubs, clubs Club, sorry, located in Tignish and Memini Gash, over the years have donated quilts to many benefits, uh, many different uh, functions, and have done a lot of volunteer work in the community. Um, and many of them uh, belong to the Victorian quilters, too. And everybody knows that Victorian quilters uh, do a lot of great work, especially with those who are um, suffering with, with cancer. And uh, you know, their, their mission is to provide handmade quilts to people living with cancer uh, by providing these quilts. Uh, they hope to bring physical comfort to those dealing with cancer as well as the spiritual comfort in knowing that they are not alone in their struggle. And these uh, quilts are a, a gift at no cost to these individuals, um, all made by volunteer uh, volunteers um, in our area. And we want to give them an, an opportunity uh, to sit down, have a meal, we're going to have live entertainment and maybe a few skits and some uh, guest speakers. Uh, so it's just to show our appreciation for those uh, who volunteer and especially those who give back to the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader the third party. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues, staff, and, and pages today. And uh, welcome to everyone in the gallery. I am Michael Oatway, Sandy Nicholson, and Karen Jackson, and Upsy. Welcome. Welcome to, to the gallery and to everyone tuning in from Charlottetown Victoria Park. And a special welcome to those tuning in t from uh, Mike Trainer's political science, political science class. Um, we're happy to have you here with us today and hope you enjoy the proceedings. Um, the Catherine Hennessy Lecture Series is being held at the Charlottetown Library and Learning Center this evening at the Rot Rotary Auditorium this evening at 7 p.m. And this year's public lecture is by urban planner Ken Kelly, and it's titled, It's Complicated, the Ever-Evolving Urban Environment. And it's a discussion on how we address the housing crisis, solve our street issues, and increase density while preserving the character of Charlottetown. Very interesting topic. Uh, and Bike Friendly Communities this weekend is excited to premiere a series of short videos focused on bike safety in, in PEI. The event, as I mentioned, is this Saturday in the Southport Room at Stratford's Town Hall. It's a free event. Uh, it starts at 11, and uh, they suggest you are SVP on their Facebook page. The Pinch Penny Fair returns to the Confederation Center of the Arts this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. This is a major fundraiser for the Friends of Confederation, the Friends of the Confederation Center. The proceeds of um, the sale fund arts education programs like the Art to Schools program, and the indoor yard sale runs from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Parents with young children can spend time in the family zone to listen to storytellers and musicians from 11 a.m. to noon. There will also be a magical balloon maker an art table to create your own masterpiece and face paint, and there will be pizza and refreshments for sale. Admission is $2, and children under 12 are admitted free. And oh, I can't remember if I welcomed Sandy Nicholson into the legislature or not. I did, I'm told. I just don't want to forget you, Sandy. Anyway, I hope that everyone has a good day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any member for Summerside, Wilma. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just like to welcome everybody into the legislature today, everybody in the gallery, everybody watching online, my faithful watchers, Joan, Kathy, Elizabeth, and Carrie. But as it was already said today, uh, Mr. Trainer's political science class. And Mr. Speaker, I just want to take a second and read the name of his 31 students out loud so that they can go into Hansard and they can be officially recognized. And I apologize to anybody in the class if I say your name wrong. Renil Atrigino. Luke Blackair, Maggie Ann Bottrell, JJ Budgel, Clarice Caldona, Charles Coloma, Lily Costine, Alyssa Deagle, Samarth Dio, Aissa Divina, Caleb Dodds, Madeline Easter, Cole Eklund, George Gallant, Zachary Gallant, Aidan Johnson, Jacob Katmuz, Louis Lorimer, Regan McLean, Thomas McNally, Ali Morrell, Nico Perocho, Taylor Perry, Gabriella Richards, AJ Royer, Abigail Skierman, Cam Skierman, Will Shaw, Aiden Sobey, Benji Tracy, and Lincoln Waugh. And Mr. Speaker, before I take my seat, I'd just like to do one more shout out. It's my wife Jillian's birthday today, and she's an absolute saint for what she puts up with in the run of a day with me, so I'd just like to wish her a happy birthday. Uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I just want to say hello to everybody watching from Charlottetown West Royalty. And I do want to say uh, hello to the political science class, and I'm going to read the names out backwards for you. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I just want to say this is great that 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 a, a, a teacher reaches out to to all aspects of this this house, and that people are watching, and that students are engaged in the. And the, in the political realm, because there's a lot to be learned, and I want to say hello to everybody uh, watching, and have a great day. Thank you. Member for O'Leary and Burness. Mr. Speaker, and I too, uh, since the Honourable Member next to me has mentioned a little bit about programs and classes, I also uh, had the opportunity to go participate and speak to the Career Bridges program in O'Leary. Uh, that building, uh, they're located in the Future Tech West building, which is no uh, mystery to where that's at in this house. Uh, the Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning took everybody out of it. Uh, we're still left with the Career Bridges program, so I appreciate that. But uh, they're a great, uh, it's a great program, and it's a, it's a career exploration program where uh, uh, people have the opportunity to try different uh, career opportunities. Uh, they have six weeks of on-the-job training as a portion of their classroom training and do a lot of interest testing. And... Uh, uh, Career Bridges is actually operated by the Tremploy organization, 
and they've hired uh, two instructors, Nancy Hamill and Paula McHugh, to uh, provide uh, guidance to the, the participants in that particular program. And uh, I think they do a wonderful job. And it's, it's so encouraging when you get into a, a group like that. And I have six of uh, my constituents are in it. There's uh, people from all the other ridings in the West uh, participate as well. But uh, when they have lots of questions about how politics works and what are issues, and uh, when they talk about some of their goals and objectives from a career perspective, uh, I really would encourage any particular employer uh, if you hire somebody that's come through the Career Bridges program, there's a pretty good chance they're going to uh, uh, be a successful employee, and uh, I really appreciate that. And also, I want to send out greetings to the UPSI members that are here and those that are watching back in O'Leary and Inverness. I know the member from Summerside, Will Mott's identified four. I usually have one, and that's Harvey uh, Culligan's usually watching. So uh, your ratings are a little higher than mine, but maybe we'll try to spike that up a little bit in future. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Member for New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I too would like to welcome everybody back for another day of deliberations and to everybody in the gallery. So nice to see a full gallery and uh, a few people whom, whom I know uh, personally. I just want to say hi to Sandy Nicholson there in the corner and Karen Jackson beside her and Michael Oatway who's sitting in the front row. And Michael is here thanks to the great public transit system that we have here on Prince Edward Island. And I know Michael um, uses the bus. It comes in from uh, Montague and is able to come here for a toonie and heads home after the proceedings or whatever he's come into town for. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And there's a living example of what um, uh, our excellent, but in need of uh, expansion public transit system is. It was a beautiful morning in the hills of Bonshaw this morning, Mr. Speaker. And uh, there was, I took my dogs out for a walk, as I try and do every morning before I come in here. And the sounds of the season were very much filling the air, lots of bird sounds and some farm sounds. I, I want to echo the, the uh, Deputy Premier's remarks and pass on my congratulations to Alvin Keenan and Ray and everybody out there in Rollo Bay Farms for that national award. Good for them. Uh, and finally, I also would like to say hi to Mr. Trainer and his uh, class there in, in Summerside. For almost 10 years now, I've received uh, a note from one or sometimes more than one member of that class asking me a series of questions. The questions never change. But what's interesting for me is how my answers have evolved over the, the nine or 10 years that I've been here. Uh, as I answer, you know, what, what's your main priority today and how are you going to serve your, your district and stuff like that. And uh, I, I, I have looked back at my old, uh, my old responses and it's really interesting to see how the province has changed, how I have changed, how this legislature has changed. But one thing that hasn't is uh, Mr. Trainer's dedication to his, his job and the wonderful things that he does to, as uh, people before me have already said, to engage the youth of this province in our democratic processes and how important that is. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Other member for Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Welcome to my colleagues and everybody in the gallery today uh, as well. Welcome to those watching from District 23. Uh, Anne, Carol, Marlene are quite frequent followers. I get three, not quite as many. but <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as mentioned in, in here this week, it's National Volunteer Week, so I want to send a huge thank you out to all the volunteers across the island who help make our lives better. And also, Mr. Speaker, we also have a family birthday uh, today. Our only granddaughter, Abigail, is celebrating her fifth birthday today, so I'd just like to say happy birthday to Abby. Thanks. Uh, statements by members. Uh, start with the leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday in this House, I was horrified by the words, attitude, and disrespect coming from the Premier when we were debating Bill 118 to remove the sick note clause from the Employment Standards Act. This act would have removed the ability for employers to ask for a sick note if an employee who falls under the act takes three or more days off due to illness. To be clear, under the act, employees can only take a maximum of six days off, three, three paid and three unpaid, and that's after three years of dedicated work. Not only did the Premier un interrupt the stranger on the floor, who just so happens to be an ER doctor, he clearly did not understand the scope of the bill. Over the last few weeks, government has been trying to give the impression that they know best. There's nothing to see here. Everything is fine. They are in control. Don't worry your precious little head. 
They say they will do anything to solve the health care crisis and that money is no issue. Yet they completely ignored an ER doctor on the floor yesterday who has the support of the PEI and Canadian Medical Societies, as well as the Canadian Association of Emergency Physici Physicians to remove sick notes. They refused to give uh, bonuses to all health care workers, weaseling their way out of it by saying they were stabilization payments. They ignored very sa real safety concerns from nurses before pushing through the opening of the QEH mental health ER, and the list goes on. The buzzwords of the week from this government is how proud they are of their balanced approach. What they fail to understand or refuse to admit is that an employee who is sick and their employer who wants a sick note are not on equal footing. This is nonsense jargon from a government that can't even do the bare minimum to help our frontline healthcare workers. The Premier used to say a good idea is a good idea is a good idea no matter where it comes from. Now he, only, now he says the only ones with a good idea in this house is government. Yesterday's behavior from that side of the house was shameful, Mr. Speaker. Premier, this is not Myron's on a Saturday night. This is the Legislative, Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island. Start acting like it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, you're welcome to uh, hold up into account, but the word uh, weaseling is unparliamentary. Can you please retract that word? I retract that word. Thank you, Member. Uh, the member for New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday's events also caused me to look back five years to a time when the legislative principles of this House were upheld, and all 27 members were encouraged to carry out one of the core functions of our jobs, that is to be legislators. Some of the most meaningful bills in recent memory were brought forward from the opposition side of this House. I'm thinking of the Poverty Elimination Strategy Act, which mandated measurable outcomes on a time-bound path to reduce and ultimately eliminate poverty on PEI. I'm thinking of the two climate action bills, which made us a national leader when it comes to carbon reduction. I'm thinking of the fall of the dollar legislation that allowed public funds to be tracked and audited. I'm thinking of the groundbreaking non-disclosure agreement legislation, the first of its kind in Canada. All of these bills and many more were drafted in the office of the Green Caucus, despite limited resources at our disposal. They were thoroughly, thoroughly researched, consulted on and debated in this House, where an attitude at that time, at least, of mutual respect and an openness to support worthy ideas still prevailed. How sad it is, then, to see a government that has closed ranks and that has closed its mind to any such thing. You may call that a fall from grace. From the Premier, we heard that it is only from the government side, with his team of legislative experts and the millions of dollars that they get paid, that real legislation can spring forth. The casual dismissal of a large portion of this House from participating in, participating in our core job was beyond shocking. And what an unambitious government they have become. This sitting's legislative agenda is without doubt the weakest list that I have ever seen in my legislative life. There is literally nothing there that could be described as close to bold or even terribly interesting. And let me be absolutely clear, that's entirely on this apathetic and directionless government, not the fine civil, civil servants we have who are only allowed to be as ambitious as their bosses allow them to be. This government is a shadow of its former self. And what a darn shame that is for Islanders in this province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Surya Myra. Hard one to follow. I'm going to use my 90 seconds, and I'm going to acknowledge some uh, some uh, groups that that deserve to be acknowledged this week. In this particular week, Mr. Speaker, it's been a busy week for highlighting some of the great groups in our province and across the country. I couldn't pick just one, so I settled on three that I need to recognize. This week is Telecommunications Week. This includes our group of 911 communications officers who are more commonly referred to as dispatchers in our province. This highly trained group of professionals is often not given the acknowledgement and praise they deserve. They are the silent heroes, the first first responders in our province. The calm voice, an expert guide to someone who may many times may be having the worst day of their lives. I can tell you firsthand from my many years of working with this incredible group that you are heroes and appreciated. So happy telecommunications week to you all. 
And Mr. Speaker, this is also RCW, PCW, and HSW week. This incredible group really is the backbone of patient care in our health care system. They spend probably more time with their patients than any other member of the health care team. Again, I've worked alongside and interacted with many of these professionals and have seen firsthand the joy and compassion they bring to those in their care. You are heroes and we appreciate the hard and important work you do every day in our hospitals and care facilities. And Mr. Speaker, last but not least, this is also Volunteer Appreciation Week. Our island is so fortunate to have so many volunteers in our communities. This includes our volunteer fire departments across the province, of which I'm proud uh, to be a, a member of, the Surrey Fire Department, our ground search and rescue groups, our countless service groups such as the Rotary Group, the Lions Club, the Knights of Columbus, the Women's Institute, Girl Guides, uh, food banks, and of course our campaign teams uh, for all members in here that help us during election time. The list goes on and on, and if time allowed, I would love to acknowledge each and every one of you here today. So, Mr. Speaker, as you see here, there are many, many uh, to be celebrated this week, and I hope everyone here joins me today in acknowledging and thanking our communications officers, our RCWs, PCWs, HSWs, as well as our volunteers that contribute so much to this province. Please know how much you are appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions by members, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So for two days, we've heard the Premier and his Minister of Health profess their belief that privatization of health care is, in their opinion, the best way forward for Islanders, forcing more and more Islanders to pay out of pocket for health care access that is the worst in the country under this Conservative government. Question to the Minister of Health. Why do you insist on prioritizing handouts for private corporations over investments and strengthening our public health care system in this province? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I do appreciate the question. Again, if we're talking about our investment in long-term care, I think it's important to note that, again, we have a hospital uh, bed problem uh, with one in seven uh, of our patients in hospital that are uh, LTC eligible. So again, um, if we can move those out of the hospital and get better care in our homes, I think that's a, a path that we have to do uh, in order to free up our health care system to eliminate uh, bed blocking at our acute care facilities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. So on February the 14th of this year, the Health Committee received a briefing on long-term care from the Department. While this minister didn't bother to attend, there were four senior officials from the Department who did present. <coughs> Now, during this presentation, the committee was told that the department had plans to open uh, 16 long-term care beds through private operators in 2024. Question to the minister. Were you involved in the negotiations of these 16 beds that were highlighted during the committee presentation on February the 14th? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and I think we've been quite clear about asking the Nursing Home Association to come in and talk about possible solutions. Um, again, uh, we, weren't, we didn't know what to expect when we had those conversations, and again, back to my original answer, uh, well, if we have the opportunity, I think, to make an impact on our health care system by moving people out of hospital who don't belong in there, I think we need to listen to our, op our operators. Um, again, did we expect to, to be advised that they had over a capacity for four, uh, over 50? I think the answer would be no. We were quite surprised and, and happy that they, they have that capacity. So again, we want to move these people out of hospital to help both our hospital system and give them the care that they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Okay, three questions. Let's see if we can get an answer to this one. Mr. Speaker, this is a very strange web that this minister is cobbling uh, together. Because less than two weeks later, the Premier, in a public speech followed by a CBC story on the 27th, informed Islanders that he and his Minister of Health had secured not 16, but 54 long-term care beds between February the 14th and the 27th through for-profit corporations. 54 beds is quite a jump from 16 in less than two weeks. Question to the Minister of Health. Were you involved in the, in the negotiations and deliberations that turned 16 for-profit beds into 54 in less than two weeks? 
the Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I hate to keep repeating myself again. Um, we had the opportunity to move people out of uh, hospital, and we're going to move forward with that. I, I, if the honourable member does dis disagrees with that uh, decision, I would ask him to reach out to those 50 odd people that are in hospital and have been there for months, some of them, and ask them if that's the kind of care that those islanders deserve. I will. I don't think they do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the opposition. Okay, so he's zero for three. Mr. Speaker, we are seeing in real time a minister completely overwhelmed. When the Premier first started taking questions directed to the Minister of Health, I thought it was because he finally realized that his minister was not up to the job. But now I'm beginning to wonder if it was because he was worried about what exactly the minister would say, what details he might accidentally let slip. A question to the minister, who was involved in negotiating the $25 million handout for profit corporations. Who is at the table from government and who is negotiating on behalf of the companies? Was the Premier correct? Was it just you, the Premier, and the private operators? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I can certainly speak for myself. I don't need the Premier to, to speak on my behalf. Thank you very much. Um, and not to make comparisons, but again, back to the former leader, Wade McLaughlin, I think you needed permission to cross the street when you uh, served under Wade. <laughs> And that is not the case in our government. He empowers our ministers, he challenges us, and he wants us to make decisions and be bold and to run our departments the best we can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Zero four four. On February the 14th, at the Standing Committee of Health, the bureaucrats presenting were unaware of the 54 new beds. So, when did you fill them in about your $25 million deal, Minister? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I'll go back to, I guess the, the Honourable Member does not want us to do that, does want, wants us to keep people in hospital unnecessarily, wants us to not provide the appropriate care for Islanders. If that's what he's saying, I would totally disagree with that premise. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Zero for five. Mr. Speaker, the Minister's unwillingness to share this information is alarming. This is public money being given to private companies, and the minister doesn't seem to think it's important to share this information with islanders, taxpayers. Question to the minister, if you are so proud of your handouts to private health care providers, why all the secrecy? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. First of all, they're not handouts. These operators provide great service to islanders. Uh, we mentioned the other day that... Anders of, of Stratford recently was awarded a, a national accreditation. So these are good, great providers. It's not a handout. They provide great services uh, to Islanders in these facilities, and we should be proud of them and that, that Islanders taking care of Islanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the opposition. I guess we'll go zero for six, Mr. Speaker. So secrecy <laughs> seems to be the rule of the day with this minister. Either that or he's so disengaged from his job that he actually doesn't know what's going on in his own department. And then we have a strange meeting with the Premier, the Minister, and the private section uh, between February the 14th and February the 27th. Minister, what bargaining position did you take into that meeting? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my bargaining position in that meeting was to listen. Um, that's what we do with our providers. Uh, again, we were, uh, as I said before, we're pleasantly surprised that they had capacity. They were willing to expand. We've had um, that's something that an offer I think that we had to consider seriously. Again, part of the long-term care review was uh, with wage comparability. So again, those two those two um, things combined together in order for us to do this. And again, um, this is what we want. It'll be a great day when we start moving those people out of hospital. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The opposition. Mr. Speaker, health care unions in this province have a history of frustration with this minister and with this government. Just last week, we had yet another union complaining that this government wouldn't engage with them in good faith. And it's easy to understand why organized labor would be upset with a government who shows a clear preference to the private sector at the expense of the public. Question to the minister. Will you finally just admit that your preferred path forward in this province is to increase privatization in health care delivery, no matter the cost? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam 
Speaker, and we do value uh, our public sector employees and the services that they do provide throughout our system. Again, we know it's challenging times. We've asked a lot from all those union members over the last four years. There's no doubt they've um, had to uh, have incredible demands on their time and, and, uh, and, the, and their workload that we've been asked uh, to do them. Again, that's why we put in programs like the, the LPN tuition program, the RCW program, is to try to help them improve that workforce. And it's starting to happen, and hopefully we'll continue that path. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So here's an easy question for the Minister to answer. Today, Minister, will you table all the contracts with private long-term care facilities that are part of your $25 million deal? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, it was outlined pretty clearly in the, in the release about the per diem rate that we do pay our operators. Uh, we do uh, negotiate, negotiate them individually. That has not happened yet, but that's the basis of the, of the nursing agreement that we have with our private uh, care operators. It's very outlined very, quite clearly in the, in the press release. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, all right, let's try this, Mr. Speaker. Since we are talking about taxpayers' money, Minister, will you table the briefing notes that you use to come up with this $25 million deal? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, the, honor, uh, the leader of the opposition is, is losing, is, uh, sorry, admitting a pretty important fact in this investment in the industry. 65% um, of those dollars are going to wages. Um, that's what we want to do is we want to bring up the private sector so it's uh, equivalent to, to the public sector. It's been in the long-term re review. It was one of the 17 recommendations. So I would, uh, again, back to that 25 million, but 65% of that is going to wages. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. UPSI does a great job uh, of representing thousands of Islanders, workers that were there for us through COVID, workers that were there for us constantly, but they're struggling. The members are struggling to make ends meet. Question to the, to the Minister. In your opinion, Minister of Health, what are their top concerns and what are you doing to solve them? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And as the member knows, we're obviously involved in the collecting bargaining process. So again, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a great idea to talk about um, specific issues. Again, there is lots of complexities to our contracts with, with our uh, unions. And again, uh, myself, uh, I don't sit at the table with those, with those negotiations. So we continue to work with them. And again, we're, we're trying to reach a, a, an agreement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hey, member for Sheraldine West Rosie. In relation to the international educated nurses you're hiring, are they being hired and compensating as RCWs or RNs? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and a good question. Again, um, the first cohort, again, will come into our system as RC, uh, RCWs and, and then will be upskilled. We have signed an agreement with SAS Polytech uh, in order to do a bridging program that they can actually start before they arrive in Canada. So it's a little bit of both. Uh, and again, it's, it's, we need, we need uh, nurses in our system, and it's another way to help our workforce uh, to give them a rest and, and to staff our facilities appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Sheraldton West Rosie. Does the same bridging program uh, relate to Islanders too as well? Just everybody else. If they are RCWs, have you spoken to the unions about how this fits within the collective agreement? Yes, the agreement that expired over a year ago. The Ministry of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure I understand the premise of the question, but obviously, um, as we bring these uh, workers into our workforce, they will become members of those unions and have all the benefits um, that other union members have. So again, um, I think um, if we can increase our workforce pool, that's what we want to do. We know there's a shortage in many of these industries. Um, we need to staff up. So again, this is one of the pathways we're doing. Another pathway is increasing the number of seats to, to 98 uh, with the nursing program at UPEI. It's at its max right now. Uh, we'd like to increase it more, but again, there's lots of levers to pull to uh, fill some of these shortages, and we continue to look at every, every lever. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Sheraldtown West Royalty. See, the problem is, as government's moving along, you're talking about two different unions, the Nurses Union and an UPSI Union, and you're not talking to, to either one, Minister. So it makes it hard for them to make decisions and know where the government's going. Minister, when was the last time you talked about this change with the unions? The uh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm 
Mr. Speaker, sorry. Uh, again, I don't sit in on, the, on, on discussions with the union as the minister. Um, again, I think we've tabled um, some meeting dates uh, in this house. Uh, again, I would encourage LPI and the unions to always get to the table. It, it's disappointing if we can't, if, we do, if one of those parties walks away, I would, I would agree with that. So again, it's important to keep having those conversations and, and to try to reach uh, an agreement for, for the betterment of Islanders and their, and their members. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Sheraldtown West Royalty. The intention is good, and we all want to get behind it, but the communication is poor. Mm -hmm. So is, is this part of the contract, Minister? And can you please table a sample contract for the IENs so that so the unions can see and that people everywhere in Prince Edward Island can see the contract? Thank you, Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I would not see an employment contract as, as a minister. Uh, I can't see why they would ever be different. Uh, a nurse is a nurse is a nurse. A uh, RCW is an RCW is an RCW, as long as they meet those credentialing and educational requirements. So I don't think there'd be any difference in any employment contracts that we would give to anybody within our system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Trevor, maybe you go back to Health PEI and just get them to table that then. Minister, some years ago, Health PEI implemented the model of care, which is client centered care. Minister, has Health PEI or yourself abandoned this model? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I am aware of the issues and the challenges that we have with our model of care and reassignments. Um, again, that's why we have some of our union members here today. Um, it's unfortunate that we have to reassign people within our system, but again, back to those seniors, we need to care for them the best we can. It's unfortunate. Again, that's why we did the LPN program. That's why we did the RC RCW, so that we can lift up that workforce. We're coming to the graduation season uh, from our educational institutions, so hopefully we can add some more bodies to give them some more help. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Once again, communication is poor. This has been in place for well over 10 years. For the model of care and long-term care facilities actually assign staff to work in specific units. And the minister knows this. This was to build rapport and relationships between staff and residents. Now we hear the staff are being reassigned to work in other units, which is quite upsetting to the point some are leaving and moving into private sector. That's why I asked you the questions earlier this week. Minister, have you discussed this change with the unions and what has been the reaction of residents and their families? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you. Uh Thank you, the member, for the question. Yeah, for sure. Um, again, continuity care is important. We all realize we want to provide continuity of care in our long-term care facilities, but we want to provide care to start. So again, when we're short in certain uh, units uh, within our long-term care um, um, uh, uh, long-term care facilities, it, pro it poses challenges for us. We want to provide care. So I don't like the option of not providing care or under-providing or under care. So again, the reassignment thing is, is, is unfortunate. I, I wouldn't enjoy it either. Um, again, I don't think the residents enjoy it. I think we all agree on that. Um, it's, I, I guess you use the word operational necessity, but we're going to work through our unions in this collective bargaining agreement so that everybody, um, we can staff our facilities to the best that we can and then provide the best care that we can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Willary Inverness. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. This government has established various net zero targets and energy requirements for 2030. The Minister for Environment actually stated in this house he is very confident PEI will meet these <coughs> targets. But evidence seems to say otherwise. Projects seem to be delayed, government roadblocks with permits, lack of skilled training for workers, and labor needs uh, to construct these projects. Lists can continue to go on. This government can't help but get in the way of everything, and usually it's because they don't do anything. Mr. Speaker, the Lennox Island First Nation are in the planning stages of PEI's largest solar farm located at Mount Pleasant in the old uh, former World War II air base. Question to the Minister of Transportation. What is the status of the two current leases at that Mount Pleasant property, and will, when will those leases expire? The Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member for the question as well. Uh, yes, I'm uh, very aware of uh, what he has put forward here. And with regard to uh, leases, there's a number of different lease agreements involved on the property, uh, which, as uh, the Honourable Member is uh, quite aware, used to uh, have the provincial uh, tourism site, which is now managed, managed quite uh, efficiently uh, by the First Nations in uh, the Member's uh, community. Uh, certainly welcome any uh, feedback from the Honourable Member on this, but uh, discussions continue with regard to uh, within government, 
my colleague to the left of me, as well as with First Nations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Willary Inverness. Minister, a little bit. There, there are two other leases, and uh, one of those leases expired in uh, the end of uh, November of last year, and the other lease expires uh, in May, uh, Mr. Speaker. The proposed Naguset solar project will provide 50,000 megawatt hours to the PEI grid. That's good carbon, clean, free energy uh, made by, and provided by PEI, and it will lead to good jobs and growth for this province, as well as for the riding of Valeria and Verness. This government has set a net zero target. That's six years from now, and this project is going to help them achieve that goal. The idea of this inaction may stall its progress is simply disappointing to see. Uh, Minister, without a lease for the land, this project cannot apply for funding. They already missed one deadline, and another one is coming up. Question to the Minister of Transportation. It's been three years that they've been working on this particular project. What are you doing to remove the roadblocks for this project is encountering and sign a lease with this Lennox Island First Nation to allow this project to get going? The Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, the Honourable Member references net zero in 2030. I think if he was actually paying attention, paying attention to some of the things, some of the initiatives that we have put in place as a government as we move forward to net zero in 2030, maybe he, uh, he wouldn't have to be coming forward with these. We work on this side of the House. We work with our partners, Mr. Speaker. Not like the previous administration who road barreled through things, just bulldozed through things to get to where they wanted to get to. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Willary and Bernard. I think this minister needs to talk to Chief uh, Bernard on that, and she'll tell you who's, who was the better party to uh, work with on these types of projects. Um, Mr. Speaker, the government spent nearly $3 million on burning over six years of biomass in this province uh, with the, in their great Carbonator 6000 idea. The Hermanville wind farm has been under production and burning up most of the time too. And, and uh, we've had a company that leave the province here just uh, recently to go to another province to set up. Question, that, this one actually to the Minister of Energy. Can you be more specific as to why you were so confident your government will meet its net zero targets by 2030? And will you inform the minister sitting next to you to get that lease signed so the Nagel Set wind farm can get going? What's the hold up? Mr. Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I'm not 100% sure you asked me about six questions there, but I'll, I'll do you a favor and I'll answer seven. Um, the, our net zero targets aren't based on electricity. The, the carbon emissions from electricity belongs to New Brunswick because that's where the majority of the power is produced. Any on-island generation that we have is renewable energy, so thus we have zero carbon emissions from electricity. We're really confident in our ability to meet our goals and our targets, as we've pointed out, because we're taking action. Uh, we're not punishing people. We're being cooperative. We're doing it in a very just manner. Uh, we're not, we, we fight against things like carbon tax, which we look at as unjust, that uh, we wish you guys would, would support us in our fight against the federal government on. Uh, we've taken action. We, instead of giving free licenses away, we're giving free heat pumps away because they actually do lower people's emissions. We, we put in a, an island-wide transit system, which the gentleman in the audience is able to use so he can come to Charlton, which we think has been a benefit socially, environmentally, and it's something the Prince of Island should have had a long time ago. And on the action it, with Lennox Island, uh, there's not a bigger supporter in this assembly that, of Chief Darlene and her actions than myself. I'll do everything I can to help her get this project on the rail. My, my understanding that, that part of it is, is fetched up in the duty to consult. We get through that. We're all on board. Thank you. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> this government has forgotten who they are elected to represent. Just days ago, the Minister of Health said that concerns raised by the frontline experts who warned him of safety issues prior to the opening of the mental health ER don't impact the decisions he makes. Guess who got physically assaulted when those safety concerns came true? Hint, it was not the Minister. Mm -hmm. Then yesterday, he did not take the advice and plea of an emergency room physician who was advocating for a small change to help her and her colleagues. Question to the Minister of Health. You don't listen to nurses. You don't listen to doctors. Who are you listening to? Mr. Health and Wellness. 
Uh, thank you, Ma uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thanks for the question. Um, I guess I, I would uh, disagree that we don't listen to our front care workers. Um, with regards to the incident at the EDSSU, I think it's very important, again, I've had a briefing on it, that this assault happened in a common clinical area. It did not happen in a patient room, so I think it's important to differentiate that. Um, that code white um, is, has been not implemented as much as it has in the past because of de-escalation training. So again, we're moving in the right direction and the unit is uh, a strong addition to our mental health uh, cap capabilities on PEI. And we listen to our health care workers in order to create that unit and we'll continue to listen to them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the location of where the assault took place makes it okay that you haven't addressed the safety concerns? Mm -hmm. No. We need a balanced approach, we're told. But it's the job of the Minister of Health to advocate for health. It is not his job to advocate for employers. It is not his job to balance his advocacy. Employers can be represented by the Minister of Workforce. The Minister of Workforce sure isn't advocating and balancing the benefit of health care, or she'd be advocating to remove sick notes herself. Question to the Minister of Health. Is this balancing act that you're doing with health and private business the reason we are seeing the systematic dismantling of our public, care, public health care system in PEI? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm not sure how to answer this question again. We do certainly value our employees in our health care system, and we're doing everything we can to support them. Um, I don't know what else to say if that, uh, from that is that they're important, we value them, I value them. Uh, I'm not involved in union uh, negotiations. We support our, our people that do there. Um, again, I have an open door. I did the focus on the tour, uh, frontline tour. I'll continue to do that. I will certainly step outside and, ha and talk with, with Karen and Sa uh, Sandy after the session, so I'll continue to listen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party. Mr. Speaker, don't worry about what you say, Minister. Your actions speak louder than your words. The Minister of Health keeps saying he'll do anything to make health care better and to help our front line. But he won't give them their due bonuses. He won't review the flawed hiring process. He won't legislate more funding for alcohol harm reduction. And he won't remove sick notes for a piddly three days. It seems that every time health care workers ask for anything, no matter how small, the minister and his cabinet have said no. Question to the minister, with this kind of treatment, are you even surprised that health care workers are leaving in droves under your watch? Health and wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And with regards to the sick notes, again, I do support any reduction in um, uh, paperwork for our doctors. I do not support the elimination of sick notes, and I, I want to clarify that. We, what was on the floor was the, the total elimination of sick notes. We need to balance our, uh, our employees. We've heard from employers that there needs to be a balance. We talked about the patient care access in Nova Scotia that has established some criteria in order to ask for, uh, uh, for sick notes. They've expanded the, the, the range of, of, of people that can do sp uh, sick notes, including nurses, pharmacists, physiotherapists. So that's a conversation I will continue to have, and I support moving to that model. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Borden Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there's been a lot of attention and scrutiny regarding the Prince County Hospital this uh, setting today, no uh, exception. The Minister has provided some comforting words of encouragement, but unfortunately has shown little evidence that things are actually improving. This problem is not just going to go away. The thousands of islanders served by the Prince County Hospital will not stop demanding full services at the Prince County Hospital, nor should they. Question to the Minister of Health. Minister, can you provide us with an update on the reopening status of the ICU at the PCH? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the honourable member for the question. We we haven't talked about the PCH in quite a while, so again, it's important to. Uh to, to, we are making advancements there. We do have one internal medicine signed. We have a, an offer uh, in front of another IM. We've added two nurse practitioners to that staff. We have, uh, I think we have three or four in that administrator role uh, in the interview process, so that's very uh, pro uh, positive. Uh, and again, from a coverage perspective, uh, I was just told this morning that thing is looking solid for the summer, so that's a good, uh, a, a nice update to get. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Bourne Kinkora. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm happy to share an update, uh, Minister, that I recently received from frontline health care workers this past week who tell me things are definitely not improving and, in their opinion, are getting much worse. 
One referred to it as a, a continuing critical care disaster, Minister, and said their hope that the ICU will ever be restored at the PCH is at an all-time low. They also pointed to instances where staff and islanders were being misled to believe recruitment was occurring when in fact those professionals are nowhere to be found. Exactly. Question to the same Minister, what is the current staffing level of critical care staff at the PCH? Mr. Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I will table our physician hiring uh, stats that I spoke of uh, a few days ago so the Honourable Member can see where those physicians are, are being hired at. We understand that we need to uh, staff that unit safely and appropriately. Critical care nurses, critical care physicians that have that skill set are extremely hard to find. Uh, again, I'll refer back to the college. One of our potential candidates um, is now available to us because of the changes that the college made in November. I don't want to discount how challenging it is. Uh, to maintain that unit at PCH. It is very, very difficult. Um, again, um, I get regular updates. Our CEO spent the week in Summerside, so I hope that she's had some good communication with the staff on the ground there. I think it was a great uh, opportunity for her to get to know the problems and the issues uh, in Summerside, and we'll continue to work on, on that facility. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Boring Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The healthcare worker at the Prince County Hospital tells me that for every one critical nurse that we hire, two leave. In fact, I'm told that a couple of recent departures are not only leaving the Prince County Hospital, but they're leaving Health PEI altogether and they're taking up positions, uh, wait for it, Mr. Speaker, as travel nurses. No. Yeah. And at least half of the remaining staff are looking for new jobs. And I can only presume, Mr. Speaker, that the two internists that were promised are still stuck somewhere in the minister's pipeline. Question to the Minister of Health. Before the fall sitting, will you commit, Minister, to holding another town hall in Summerside to update Islanders on the progress that you've made to bring back the ICU to the PCH? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I would agree with it is time to provide an update to both the Mayor, who has written a letter to us uh, with some of his recommendations, and again, back to the, to the PCH and the public, I would agree with the, with, the minister, uh, with the Member that we need to provide an update. Um, it has been going in the positive direction. Um, again, these are really hard steps to take. They're difficult to staff critical care. Again, that, that skill set, and when you have a low complement of, of uh, critical care nurses or anything, the demands on them are significant. We recognize that and it's hard to maintain that pace. We've seen that with our respiratory therapists and how hard they were working. Um, it was basically work, eat, sleep, and that's not fair to anybody. So we'll continue to support the PCH as much as possible. I appreciate uh, your advocacy. Uh, again, I, I don't like words with I'm told. I, I, I like to uh, deal with facts. So if you can bring me some, some actual stats or who left and why, we'll, we'll certainly look at it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Healthy learners are successful learners. And that's why our policies and programs and service around school food and healthy nutrition matter so much. These skill benefits these skills benefit students their whole lives. Question to the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. How do we promote and encourage healthy nutrition and healthy choices in our schools? The Minister of Education and Early Years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. Thank you for the question. Certainly we know our, our kids can't learn um, without food in their bellies, so um, we take this matter very seriously in our schools. Um, healthy eating, of course, it starts at home, but our, our schools do have an important uh, role in all of this, and I'm really proud. I think we can all be very proud of the lunch program that we have within our schools, our snack programs, our breakfast programs. In fact, this year, it's estimated that 800,000 meals will be served through our lunch programs, and again, the uptake on our breakfast and snack programs are, um, are, are quite high, so I think we're doing a tremendous job here within our schools, um, and, uh, but certainly there's always more work to be done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, member for Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our school nutrition policies talk about the criteria for quality for vending machines, restricting energy drinks, and creating a climate to promote healthy eating. Um, question to the same minister. How do we measure the success of our school's nutrition policies, and when were they last reviewed? Minister of Education, early years. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. Our school food program certainly can be measured by the nutritional value of the food as well as the uptake, which has been high, as I had, uh, had said previously. You mentioned our policies, so we do have a number of different policies, the PSB does. Um, 
So one, our nutrition in schools policy, as you mentioned. That was uh, last, I believe it was developed in 2010, and it was updated in 2016. So the CSLF would have a similar policy. Uh, in addition, we, we do have operational policies. So that would sort of standardize some pricing, the rules around advertising, vending machines, et cetera. And our, the PSB as well uses a guide to food choices. So we try to make sure that any foods served in our schools are you know, whole grain, um, minimally or non processed, uh, locally sourced, seasonably available, and et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Charlotte Town Belvedere. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as you mentioned, the Public Schools Branch Nutrition Policy was last updated in 2016. We've made great strides with our school breakfast programs and with the PEI School Food Program since 2020. The Canadian Food Guide was also updated in 2019. Now the federal government is looking at to, uh, to invest more into our school food programs. It's not lost on me the cost of food these days and how difficult times are for families and understanding the importance of economical healthy food, but we want our students to learn the value of healthy food choices that will lead to a lifetime of good health. Question to the same minister. How can we strengthen our school nutrition policies and programs to reach a goal of better nutrition and healthy eating choices for our students? The Minister of Education Early Years. Thank you again, Honourable Member, and I really do appreciate um, your passion on this. I'm very passionate myself about nutrition. I know we've got some uh, great team members that um, live and breathe uh, this daily, so I uh, really want to give them a shout out if they're, they're watching. Um, certainly the curriculum around nutrition within our schools is very strong. As it relates to our policy in 2020, we are in the midst of updating it, and at that point we made the decision to um, uh, start a school food um, lunch program and that uh, really we did redirect our focus to that so um, the the policy updates sort of had been on hold but I think that's something that we need to look at um, because again it is incredibly important so I'm looking forward to uh, reconvening and working with our school authorities on ensuring that our policies are up to date um, and that we continue to ensure that we are feeding our kids the most nutritious food and that we're also educating their families and a lot of it, as I said previously, it starts at home. So what can we do to engage families and uh, caregivers in that regard? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've been talking in this house a lot about health care recruitment. But one part that we haven't talked enough about is adding associate physicians to our island health care system, with the exception to the member from Time Valley Sherbrooke, who's an advocate for it. Associate physician, physicians are internationally trained doctors who haven't met the local licensing requirement yet most of the time. A question for the Minister of Health. What update can you give the House on adding the new associate physicians to our health care system? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member for the question. Um, yes, a very exciting uh, addition to our system. I think it's important to note that uh, they don't replace our physicians or nurse, uh, nurse practitioners within our system. Um, the interest has been extremely high, and again, our, probably our best international recruiter sits beside you. He's, he's been great to, to, to deal and handhold some of our international uh, physicians. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is we've had, like, I think more than 50 applicants. The big challenge with is verifying credentials. Uh, again, that's what I think we didn't expect, that it would be so difficult to verify their training uh, and, their, and their, um, uh, their past experience. So, again, it's a challenge, but the uptake has been very positive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was hopeful to hear that we reached out to everyone and we had a bunch lined up to come. But creating a path to get more doctors licensed and working in our health care system is a good thing. So I support Ed and associate physicians. A question back to the Minister of Health. I realize that each person has different education skills, as you pointed out, and experiences. So the process would be different to get them licensed. On average, how long does it take to get an associate physician licensed? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you. So it, we should also talk about uh, physician assistants too and associate physicians. So again, it is uh, a very difficult process. Government does not do it. It's the College of Physicians that verify their eligibility uh, to do this. Um, 
I do know that I believe at least about nine or ten have been screened in so far that meet those requirements. Um, again, uh, back to a, a hiring uh, update or something, it would be nice to, to uh, provide that in the fall. I do know we have a signed agreement with a PA who I believe is going to Western PEI uh, somewhere. And I want to talk about currency of practice. One of the biggest hurdles is, they call it currency of practice, is that these physicians uh, have to have 450 hours of, of uh, a currency of practice over the last five years. So that's where they fall off a lot, is that some people have not been a physician for longer than that or have not practiced as long as that. Um, so again, uh, the physician that was uh, trained in Mexico, that was at the town hall in PCH, I know we've brought her and had a, co a conversation. What I like about this is this is another pathway for those physicians to take the Royal College exam and become a physician on PEI. So that's very exciting to me. Um, I anticipate we'll probably add nine or 10 to our system. We have to do it slow and integrate in with our all our other providers, because obviously this is a new position and uh, how they interact with our nurses and our physicians and our nurse practitioners. So we want to go slow, but we want to do it right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think associate physicians and physician assistants are a great add to our health care team and support for the existing workforce, especially at the Prince County Hospital. And Mr. Speaker, we all know that the Prince County Hospital can use any help, any support that we can give them. So Mr. Speaker, another question to the Minister of Health. Are any of these new associate physicians or physician assistants slated to work at the PCH? And if so, when might we expect on seeing them join the team? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and a good question. It will take some time. Um, again, I think we're very pleased with the uptake from our physicians because a, a physician has to agree to take uh, an AP under their wing, so to speak, in order to, to work under their supervision. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers on that, but the la it's quite significant. I even know the orthopedic group, um, and when I had my uh, follow-up uh, uh, appointment, uh, have expressed interest in taking an orthopedic in order to support their group. So again, the physicians have to support the AP because they do work under the supervision. I'm sure there's some great physicians at PCH that are willing to do so, and I can go back to the department and see see if there's uh, some uptake yet at the PCH. Thank you. Member for Charlton West Geraldi, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, I asked the um, Michael Trainer um, if the students had one question they wanted to ask, what could it be? And uh, the students watching online, this is your question. They're wondering, the students are curious about the shelter support capacity in, in Summerside. Why is there nobody living in the shelters? Why is it not been used so far? And what are the security enforcements? And I'll ask that to the Minister of Finance because she improved this. These students are asking these important questions. Why are the shelter systems not set up in Summerside? The Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll thank the class for that question. Um, um, I think um, from what I heard was there, there's a, um, the trailers are on site, um, and I think what they're trying to negotiate now is a deal with a provider to oversee that site, and I think that that might be the hang-up that they're waiting, but I think they have are close in a negotiation, and once that, that's in play, then I think we'll start to see things happen fairly quickly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Deputy Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, by command of His Honor, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg to table the annual report of the Department of Justice and Public Safety for the period ending March 31st, 2023. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that this said document do now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry? carry. Reports by committees. Introduction of government bills. Government motions. Orders of the day government. The Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Finance that the first order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? carry. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to further consider the grant of supply of His Majesty. Shall it carry. carry? I'll ask the member for Summerside Wilmot to chair Committee of the Whole.
This House is now in committee of the Hall House to consider the grant of supply to His Majesty. Minister, would you like to take a stranger to the floor? Yes, I would. Shall it be carried? <laughs> Will it carry? <laughs> okay. You're good. <laughs> uh, okay, Jerry. Uh, uh, I'm going to turn this green light off and say some things back. <laughs> If we could get the stranger to state her name and position for Hansard. Uh, Trish Cameron McDonald, the Director of Finance for Social Development and Seniors. Thank you. Members, we are on page 155. Uh, and we left off yesterday with Charlottetown West Royalty. And I, they are not here. I have Leader of the Opposition next for questions. And then you, and then you. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. Um, caregiver grants, I know it was discussed yesterday, um, but I just need for clarification, because I've had people ask me last night, this is something, and I've questioned this in the House too, it was, it was an announcement during the campaign promise that many, many Islanders look forward to, and many Islanders chose to support your government for that one particular program. So now it's, it's a year, um, and they've been waiting for this to, to start. Can you give us a definite date on when this program will be beginning? And uh, we'll start there. Um, so the budget for caregiver grants is in the Health and Wellness Department. Yeah. <coughs> Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, very Chair. So do you guys deal with the, you don't have anything to do with the caregiver grant? It's not in our budget. Leader of the opposition. But you don't administer it or anything like that? We are supporting them, but it's not in our budget. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. Chair. So how do you support them? We are helping, our staff is helping to meet with clients and administer the payments. It's not our budget and it's not, we don't have the policy determination on the program. And Leader of the opposition. Okay, so since you have that working relationship with health, what is the expected uh, start time for this program? Um, I'll need to bring that back. Okay. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. Uh, the Seniors Independence Initiative, you guys have uh, that under this uh, particular section. So we talked about uh, that. Uh, one, two, let me look at my line item here. Okay. Um, but is there any. Um, I guess what I want to know is regionally, what is the uptake on that program? Is there a breakdown regionally on it? For the Seniors Independence? Independence program. I'm sure there is. I do not have it here with me. Okay. I could bring that back okay. if you'd like. Leader of the Opposition, Thank last you. one of the set. Thank you, Chair. The reason why I asked that, I just wanted to know, you know, if, if the information is getting out there to individuals. It's a great program. Uh, it really, really is. I just want to make sure that all those who are eligible for that program have an opportunity to uh, to apply for it and receive you know, th that, that help that they get. Because I know in my district I try to promote it as much as I can, mm -hmm. but I just want to ensure that all other districts or all other regions of Prince Edward Island uh, reach those who, who are in need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we just did, uh, we hired a new seniors navigator mm -hmm. for West West Prince mm -hmm. and um, we ran an ad on Compass for two full weeks with the navigator's phone number, so because we know that seniors, most of them watch Compass, and mm -hmm. so we figured that was a good way to connect with them. And, and our seniors navigators are going um, all over the all over the province to um, have uh, like at access PEIs mm -hmm. and things like that for to, to meet with clients. And, yeah, so yeah. O'Leary and Vernas. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Appreciate this. Uh, Minister, you had mentioned, uh, you stated a number of times that you're, you have an increase in your budget. And I'm, I'm baffled why you keep t continuing to say that when I look at the fact that you spent $138,774,300 last year on people with disabilities and people that with social services support. And this year, all you have in the budget is 134. That's a 3 to $4 million cut to our most vulnerable people in Prince Edward Island. And I can see where you cut services to uh, the Accessibility Supports Program by about $8 million. You've cut 
the Seniors Independence Initiative by one million. And uh, I've seen you've increased some professional services, uh, you know, great on that, and you've added in the child benefit. Mm -hmm. But my question, Chair, comes back to uh, wh why you keep saying that this is an increase. <laughs> I can't, it baffles me. Minister? On page 153, you'll see that our budget last year for fiscal year 23-24 was 161.9 million, almost $162 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, fiscal year 24-25 budget is 176.7 million, mm -hmm. uh, so a 14.8, almost 50 million dollar increase, 9% increase, and the forecast was uh, $100,000 under our new year budget. Olaria and Verness. But those, those, but those dollars, those increases in dollars, aren't not necessarily going to the vulnerable. Where they're mostly going to the people that you really are dealing with are seniors and the Seniors Independence Initiative, Social Assistance Benefits is a key component of that. To which that, when you're approximately around the same amount of money, it's a little bit less than what you spent last time. Uh, and, and once again to the disabled the, through the accessibility. So if you look at just this section on social programming, it's a cut. Mm. And the funding is appropriated to the budget, to the department as a whole. And throughout the year, as we uh, monitor our spend and our forecast, we're looking at the department as a whole. Oh, and okay. in some areas, they may be underspends that we are able to um, allocate to the areas where they're spending pressures. O'Leary and Verness. So when, when you're saying that you may have to go to special warrants on the section, say, as an, on accessibility supports, uh, are you saying you're going to take that money then from somewhere else and not have to go to a special warrant? Which goes back to the point, are you really increasing it or are you cutting it? I did not say we may need to go to a special warrant. I said if we may, we would follow the provisions and the instructions right. in the Financial Administration mm -hmm. Act. And we will not know if there will be a need for a special warrant until we see how the spending in, for the entire department plays out. Mm -hmm. O'Leary and Verness. Minister, do you feel that there's going to be less people requiring social supports uh, in the coming year or more people? Um, I, I feel, um, as the uh, CFO said, um, that our, our department's uh, budget is it's flexible and there are different needs throughout the, uh, of the department and some are greater and some are less and, and it's hard to predict but that the money is there um, if, if we're going to need it. And if not, if we have to go to a special warrant, there's no better reason to go to a special mm -hmm. warrant than for our, for our most vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. So I hope we don't have to do that, but our budget is our budget, and we're not going to be able to change that today. O'Leary and Verness, last one of your set. But the, therein lies the point. This whole exercise of going through the budget is to try to have these numbers as reflective of what the needs of people would be. We as legislators sit here and we, we go through this budget to provide some sense of transparency and accountability to, uh, to the public. And uh, when you know, we look at numbers and, and there's not a lot of uh, rationale behind why a number is other than saying, we're going to take from another section of our department if we're, we're under budget, and if we had to do a special warrant, that's a good thing. Um, I, I would argue the Auditor General tries to frown upon the fact that we're doing special warrants at all, but I understand how a special warrant works and, and why they're required, and things do become unexpected in uh, the uh, delivery of services that you are required to give to Islanders. Um, so, you know, now, I'll, I'll ask just the question just on uh, supports for our non-governmental groups. Is that in this section here? So the, ones I'm, the one I'm thinking about is community inclusions, but community connections in your riding minister uh, would also be uh, a, a group that, so is that under this mm -hmm. section of social programming? It's on the community grants line. On the community grants, yep. okay. $1.6 million increase this year, okay. which is about 12%. Um, they provide an incredible service, mm -hmm. and uh, we value their services very much. We met with every one of them this yeah. year to talk about the needs and the spending pressures. Put me on the list, though. And we allocated the $1.6 million out as needed. Okay, I'll, I'll have more questions later. Uh, when I, my turn comes up again. Thanks, yeah. Chair. We'll keep, them, we'll keep them to sets of five. Thank we'll you. get back to you, I'm I sure know. of it. I know. Yeah. Uh, leader of the third party. <laughs> Chair. 
Um, and welcome back, Trish. Uh, I'm wondering if you can tell us what the Indigenous Program a Analyst is. Is that a new position? I'll just catch up to you for a sec. Uh, you would be on our budget handouts? Yes. And in the FTEs for social programs, I'm thinking that's a child and family position. You're on page SDS1? SDS1. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. And which, do you have a number associated to the left hand side of? Uh, oh, I'm looking at the division. It's a different, oh, she, oh, sorry, it's a different division. Yeah. That, okay. We'll answer it. It's with the strategy policy and seniors, which we, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a policy position. Is that filled? Yes. Is it? Sorry, Chair. Leader, third oh, Thank you. I know. Sorry. I, I appreciate it's in a different section. I didn't realize that when I asked the question. Um, is that a new position? Is it filled? No. Um, it's. Um, no, it's not a new position. Okay. okay. I've been with the Department about three years, and it's been there three years. Okay. Yeah, it's been filled. Leader, third party. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't notice the section when I asked the question. Um, so I'm just looking at the the school breakfast program, and I'm wondering, um, is there? I know that this is a, a new program. Uh, the the breakfast pro like I'm wondering the difference in the funding from previous years to this year. Is there much of an increase? Um, to help me answer that, uh, we have the PEI School Food Program Inc. in our department. And the breakfast program is with education. Education. Yeah. Okay. Leader of third party. Okay. I am good, Chair. Thank you. Charlton West Royalty. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back, Minister. Um, just some questions on, um, I kind of asked some questions in the ledge about accessibility and, and that support program. So is the, the questions that were, we received information back, but I um, just have some questions on it. On March 18th, in the response to 2021, a contract uh, was executed between the government of PEI and the PEI Council for Disabilities, now resource ability for 95000 That was in 2021. Um, is, that, is that funding, was it annualized? No, and that, that funding was paid um, a few years ago. Yeah. Like you said, it was signed in 2021. Um, and created a fund within resource abilities to try to increase, um, like for taxis and different companies to add to their vehicles to become more accessible. Um, the spending, there's still money in that fund, oh. so not a need for it to be spent. Our director has been meeting with resource abilities, um, made some changes to maybe the parameters, try to get it spent. Um, it would be nice to see it fully expended and uh, when that can happen, we'll certainly entertain yeah. consideration of, of another fund yeah. or another installment. Cheryl Town West Royalty. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's the problem. Minister, do you think it appropriate when, is, is this, we're not, we don't have this operating in, in the capital area, correct? Is that, is that, there's no transportation under this fund? Under. Well. Under that fund, there isn't. We do have three non-government organizations that we fund under the community grants line, Transportation East, Transportation West, Pat and the Elephant. And we also have funding to individual clients um, for their transportation yeah. needs as well. Sure, I'll down West Royalty. And so in the response back that, that I received uh, a few days ago, mm -hmm. it says, quote, two grants of $20,000 have been awarded to date, each to United Taxi of Summerside. Um, one of these taxis is intended to be operating out of Charlottetown in the coming weeks. But in the, in the government's own report on March 10th, 2021, it says that uh, rebates will cover 20% of the cost up to a maximum of $10,000. But in here it says they're $20,000 grants of one out. But you had a maximum of 10,000 and you gave 20,000 to the same company, why? Well, I do know that he has more than one vehicle. Sure, I'll tell him what's royalty. You can have a, you can have a hundred vehicles, but when you set the criteria in your own government statement, 
where it says to a maximum of $10,000. Minister, you gave $20,000 to the same company twice and the service isn't running. Why, Minister? Well, as, as um, the CFO just said, I, our, our director is now meeting with that, um, with that NGO, but we will definitely take that back. I'd have to take that back. Mm -hmm. Cheryl Town was royalty. Would you agree that this doesn't make any sense? Is did did more money go out to the same person that says forty thousand dollars went out when the, the program has a maximum of ten thousand dollars and it's not running in Charlottetown? I don't understand what's going I will on. I definitely here. take that back. Well, Cheryl Town was royalty. This and currently there are no reporting requirements in place for tracking the participant rates of the accessibility taxis using this rebate program in your own data back. So we've given out more money on top of the maximum minister and there's no reporting requirements. Why are there no reporting requirements attached to this? I will take that back. <coughs> I mean, I, can, I, I can't answer what, I, what I'm not sure of, so I will definitely take that back. Cheryl Town West Realty, last well, one of your set. That's what's difficult is that you provided me these inform Minister, you provided me this information and you don't understand what's in this information. I don't understand why there's no com is is this because it was a grant? I might let you off the hook here. Is this because it was a grant or why is there no reporting requirements attached to a fund that's not working for PEI when they need to get around in, in Charlottetown on a failed program? It is a grant and we are well aware that the Director of Social Programs has been working with Resource Abilities to look at the criteria to try to have the funds expended. Yeah. Because what we want most is for more accessible transportation yes. to be available. And that could be possibly why you're seeing uh, the funding amount in a uh, double what the criteria said. But I, we're not certain. We need to go back to the Director of Social Programs who's been managing the contract and the relationship. We can certainly come back if you like. Yes. In the response. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. O'Leary Inverness. Uh, Minister, to get back to our community grants and community inclusions, um, so I'll say there is an increase in that budget line over last time. It's, uh, can you tell me how much uh, community inclusions got last year and how much they're going to get this year? A uh, 15% increase. They get a 15%, but how much did they get last year? 1,028,800. They now have 1,178,800. O'Leary and Vernes. So what, what was the second number, what they're getting this oh, year? Sorry. I don't my. Uh, so 1,028,800 last year. Yeah. 1,078,800 this year. Perfect. Um, a 15% increase. Mm -hmm. O'Leary and Vernes. How do those grants work as far as, is it based on the amount of people that they, they have or do they submit just a budget and, and they get money based on a, a year and if they have more people come in, uh, they get, they just have to make do or how does that work? We provide funding um, quarterly and we have them in in the fall of every year as part of our planning for, for the next year budget. Um, we look at their financial statements. They have a a meeting with us to talk about the funding pressures that they are experiencing, which would include their client base increase, uh, some of the critical challenges that their clients are having, um, and based on the need of the entire group, we've put together uh, a request to put forward into mm -hmm. our management plan. This is the highest increase that yeah. we've had in quite a while for non-government organizations. O'Leary and Vernes. And, and I can appreciate that it's a good increase, but also the operational costs have probably increased uh, comparably. And I'd also yeah. argue that uh, their volume of uh, individuals requiring their services has increased. Absolutely. So, so you know, so in, in the general scheme of things, we're really, they're, they're still struggling. Absolutely. <laughs> okay? And we do, uh, like the director of social programs and the manager for um, the program is in constant contact with all of the NGOs. Mm -hmm. Um, it's okay. not abnormal for us to support them in addition to what we have in the base budget line mm -hmm. as the year goes on. Uh, it's very incredible to see how well our team works with the NGOs mm -hmm. and support mm -hmm. them. Um, in addition to the 1,635,500 increase for the community grants line, 
The specialized residential supports line had a $3 million increase, and that's primarily NGOs providing those services okay. as well. So uh, really, you could say it's almost $5 million this year. We're very happy to have that increase for them. Mm -hmm. O'Leary and Verness. So why why are they saying they're still struggling? Why can't they find staff? Why can't they provide uh, services for, like, say, individuals that require uh, mm -hmm. home support uh, to do that? That that I mean, in the end of the day, we're, we can say we're giving them an increase, and, and I appreciate that. And I, I might comment that they do. The feedback I get is that you do have a good relationship with mm -hmm. with them. There's no disputing mm -hmm. that. But it, it needs to be responsive to situations and. Uh, in the end of the day, these are very vulnerable people. Their ability to advocate for themselves and their families to advocate is, is, uh, is challenging for them. And uh, when I look at a circumstance where an organization like Community Inclusions, who has contracts with your department, says that uh, we cannot get staff, we don't have enough money, we cannot offer them more money to get more staff, and we're not able to meet the needs of our clientele. Yeah. So, so how do you respond with that? If it's not enough at 15%, <laughs> you know, where, where, what should it be? And, and will there be a, an infusion of money to meet their needs uh, at the, you know, uh, at the next quarter? Um, very valuable point. Uh, the stat that I threw out uh, yesterday as well um, tied more to the AAS line, but there is a 60% growth in the accessibility support clients, which are oftentimes also supported by the NGO, so that's an indicator as well as to the increase. Um, I'm quite proud of the team that supports the NGOs. I think they do a really mm -hmm. good job. Um, last year we provided, I believe it was a 6% across the board to the NGOs. Um, I'm glad to hear, like this year we've doubled that. If we look at the, the total increase, and we actually had meetings with each one to understand the staffing challenges that they're having um, and the other inflationary costs that are really driving. Um, so it is, I feel good that we've doubled what we provided them the year before, in addition to the $3 million that we added to budget um, that will provide 55 clients with a stable residential mm -hmm. um, solution. Um, but the team isn't going to stop there. Like We'll continue to work with them every year. Uh, hopefully, next year we'll have a, a strong increase as well um, to be determined. O'Leary and Burness, last one of your set. Uh, Minister, do you feel, once again, if I look at uh, the same question I've been asking, do you feel there's going to be more people requiring uh, supports by our non-governmental organizations, or do you think there will be less people uh, in the coming year. Once again, they, they have adults that, you know, pass away, move away. Uh, we also have, in my opinion, more people coming in from the system. I mean, I, I used to work with Community Inclusion, so I'm well familiar with the organization. And uh, all we're seeing is more and more people either are moving here with, uh, uh, as families with people with disabilities. Uh, so what's your opinion on that, Minister? Well, my opinion is, is that that it, it has grown, so it will probably continue to grow, That's right. and that it's a legislative program, and so we are going to have the money for this program, mm -hmm. you know. We're going to do everything we can for the most vulnerable. Okay. Put me on the list for Sure thing. Uh, Cheryl Town West Royalty. You said you're, you're going to do everything you can for the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. um, and the programs have grown, so I'll mm -hmm. just pick up from my uh, O'Leary and Vanessa and I'll move to um, a topic uh, that's important here. So Stars for Life Foundation um, in the budget. Well, thank you for the funding that you're giving them, but it, I, um, I just want to start here. On this budget line uh, in here, it's 533,000. Uh, that's for a three, that's for, that's till January 31st. What is, what is that annualized? You just let me catch up to you. You're on oh, the handout. Oh, sorry, I'm in the, uh, yeah, right. division. And, um, page four or five uh, in the big Thank book. Thank you. So the Stars for Life grant, which they rely on to mm. um, <coughs> so much. So, okay, I'll start with uh, their actual total budget last year was 556,200. Um, they have a, I have to put these on again, sorry. Um, $90,100 increase, so that's 16% to 646,300. 
When the departments prepare these budget handouts, um, we're preparing them as of January 31st. So I can tell you we were monitoring very closely to make sure every NGO got all of the money that they were budgeted. Uh, so there must have been a, a payment after, in February and March that brought them up to their total. Charlton West Royalty. And it's, so this is what we have to work on in here. And it's no, it's the, the numbers are, I mean, I understand the budgeting process, but I think we talked about this last time. But I don't want to waste my set on, on mm. this. I'll talk about this later. But so um, the 646 says, I know that their request was close, closer to, somewhere closer to maybe a million dollars. Um, because the, that's where demand is. They are they they are not provide. They're not able to provide food. They're they're having to run major fundraising events. Thank you for the increase. And they're going to be. They're, they need it just just to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, we're asking them to build housing. We're asking them to uh, do all kinds of different things because there's so many people in this program. Mm -hmm. um, how did you determine that? the number of 646,000 was enough for such an incredible organization? Uh, uh, same, sorry. The process that I had spoken to earlier, we meet with every, each one of the NGOs. They provide us the a budget request. Uh, they provide us their financial statements. Uh, we get to sit down and talk about the pressures. Yeah. We do that with every one of them. Mm -hmm. And um, so it is always a, a balancing uh, amongst all of the NGOs. Um, I might also add that Stars for Life is considered one of the residential NGOs as well. So uh, I believe in the funding line under specialized residential supports that had the $3 million increase. Um, I don't have the information with me, but Stars for Life would have re could have possibly received some of that money as well. I could take that back if you like. Geraldtown West Royalty. And I'm glad to hear because they're watching and I'm, uh, I know they're very, you know, they're, they're just, they're concerned because they don't get the opportunity to look for special warrants. What happens to them is they have to start looking at cuts. Mm. And that's the conversation that I don't want them to ever have because mm. they're doing more um, with, with, with a little bit more, but, but a little bit more is not meeting their needs. It's, it's double what we were able to provide them last year. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, I agree with you, this is very concerning. Um, I do really appreciate the strong relationship that the program manager yeah, and the director great. have. Um, and I, it's not odd for us to have a request come in that is granted. Mm -hmm. um, as we go through the year and we manage the spend for the department total, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Charlottetown West Royalty. And I agree. Like the, the increases are there. I mean, you've done mm -hmm. done a little bit. Part of the part of the problem, I think, too, is is communication when the budget comes out. And uh, I mean, I, I just I reached out to them this morning, and they they still d didn't know. And they have to do planning. So I mean, this That's is what's good about this conversation. <laughs> but but it, it's. They do the residential component, which is separate of what they do in their day programming. They don't have the space between the two. They do not have the space. And so these are things that the government's talking to them about further space for both programming and residential components because it's becoming, it's becoming a service that is so needed for the family. So uh, I guess I'm just, just the, uh, just my question is the residential, the $3 million increase, is that for a capital area, or is that was that in this budget as well? It was to um, solidify a placements, residential placements for 55 clients. Some of those would be an NGO that already, that already has a home, and it would be the operating costs. Some were to NGOs to secure a, a home, yeah. um, and then the operating costs will come when the home is in place. So yeah. it's a mix of both. To us, they're all operating grants because it's oh, not going to be our, our asset. Um, but really, we're funding the NGOs in whatever way they need the funding to be able to put the placements together. Okay. Charlottetown West Royalty, last one of your set. And yeah, and I, I, I appreciate it. And, and I, I just, maybe I'm making a, a, a thing for, during this budget, where we're working on two different things for Stars for Life. They're very important because there's no, there's no housing. 
um, and it needs to be done. I guess I'm making a plea just quickly while the chair is not paying attention is that we need capital support for Stars for Life and we can't be bickering around with what we're doing to get there. So I'm expecting big things in the capital budget. Would you agree with that, Minister? I agree with looking after everybody to the very best of our ability, absolutely. <laughs> O'Leary Inverness. Uh, Minister, like I brought up the issue of human service workers, and we know there's certainly departments that are uh, providing more supports for those professions. Uh, do you agree that human service workers are not paid uh, to the value of their work? My goodness, you can't pay those folks enough. You know, okay. I mean, pe people are working hard. Like, you know, they're, these, are, these are not easy jobs, and, and I appreciate that. So, yes. O'Leary Inverness. So this is the problem, is that people are leaving that profession to go to, well, I shouldn't say they're leaving the profession. They're le leaving the non-governmental employers to go mm -hmm. uh, to uh, competing uh, job offers within other government departments, OK? So have you a plan in place to deal with uh, issues like encouraging more people to take human services training? Um, uh, wages for non-government organizations was one of the significant topics in our meetings this mm -hmm. fall. Um, we, the challenges that we're seeing is that um, each NGO is paying a different wage. Some have unions, some don't. For the most part, most of them have unions, some don't. Um, there are a lot of challenges that need to be looked at as a sector. We support the sector. We're not in the sector. Um, so it's certainly a challenge. Yeah, it's a good point. O'Leary and Verness. So, Minister, are you uh, working with the Minister of Finance to see that there will be wage parity? Uh, you, your, your government has stated that you'll provide wage parity with uh, uh, community um, Care facilities, me. private community care facilities, wage parity. Are you going to do that for non governmental organizations who are also dealing with the same issue where your other departments are taking workers from them, mainly the, the school system uh, and the health care system, uh, to even that uh, playing field? So, will you, will you be providing wage parity? Because it will have an impact on the budget in the near future. I would have to have further discussions on that. O'Leary and Verness. What would be the impediments of doing that? Uh, Kurt, sorry, I have been um, in some of the discussions when we talk and, oh, and we want to be able to provide a proper wage for NGOs. Um, one of the impediments are they all have a different union. Um, and some don't have a union. Larry and Vernas, last one in your set. Wouldn't that be the same circumstance as your community care facilities? Um, I shouldn't say yours, the government's community care facilities that it's going to negotiate or that it gave $25 million to. I think what you're raising, I, I can't disagree with you. I'm quite <laughs> concerned about it, really, with wages. Um, there are some challenges. Um, it is something that has been discussed with the NGOs amongst our own senior management team. I would love to be able to make a commitment to you. I don't have the ability, uh, but I can tell you that it is a concern and we are talking about it. And we are aware of some of the major impediments and challenges um, and a very strong point. Thank you. Charlottetown West Royalty. Oh, oh. put me on the list again there, Chair, please. Yes. I got you. Yeah. Um, Minister, just asking you some one more thing about, about Stars for Life. Will, will you commit to going out within a month of the legislative sitting, going out and and touring Stars for Life, um, and 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 maybe breaking down the six hundred and forty-six thousand three hundred dollars and any money, uh, just maybe just with one sheet of paper, just to, so they they can get it on paper. But more, more importantly, go out and, 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 and see the facility and, and meet the executive director. Would you commit to bringing that information to them and, and going to meet with the executive director? I would certainly commit to going out and, and um, 
and touring that facility. I would love to, actually. I think it's the only one I didn't get to tour. I've toured, you know. Great. And uh, but anyway, just when the house opens, things change, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. But yes, I would certainly commit to going out to tour <clears throat> that facility. And you, I'd be, invite you to come as I did the member behind right. you to his facility in, in uh, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I enjoy that. Yeah. Great. Charlton West Royalty. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, while we're there, we can go up to the, 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 the Queens County Residential Services is another great organization. It's just, just up the street, and they do incredible work. Um, mm -hmm. Incredible work. So, the, but again, my question is with the, in the budget book. It was only, uh, it's, it's only to January 31st, 2024. And I don't see what was, what was provided last year or, well, I guess this is, this is not the grant for next year. You're looking at the handouts yeah. that we prepared. Um, we had to submit them in like middle of February so they could all be bound together. Sure. Um, and so all the CFOs made the commitment to say we'll take payments in that year up to January 31st. Yeah. Because like it was February when we printed yeah, them. I understand. Yeah. So, yes. Charlton, what's yeah. Charlton? And then, but I guess. Could, I guess the way the budget works and with the grants, you know, it's, it's, it's well, I don't want to sell the chief financial officer, you know what's going on, but to see what's the last year and then because I was up looking at my book last year and trying to figure out what what was what was estimated and what was spent and it's it, it's difficult with this. So is there anything that you think in this area um, that that can be within your capability of knowing that the budget's going to go in February? Is this as much information as we, we can receive or is there anything we can we can do next year to I will answer this but oh, I will no. also preface it with the decisions that we made on how to provide this information was was made with a number of people around the table not just me yeah um, but last year when we came into the house we put our like my departmental budget handouts we passed it out at that time mm -hmm. yeah. so um, if we did that same approach this year I could have passed out something that would include everything until March 31st. Yeah. Yeah. But I do not make that decision on my own. Yeah. Charlton West Royalty. No, and I, I understand that. And this is a new process for us going earlier. And, and I mean, you're just coming off the Capitol and then you're, it's, it's a very, it's a very difficult time for the financial people. And I understand the turnover must be just incredible. So thank you for, for your work. Uh, but how do I find out what was, um, spent now for Queens County Residential Services last year, and what is their grant for next year? Is that possible? Uh, so, what I have with me is their budget last year, their new year budget, what the percentage increase was. I don't have with me what we spent um, in the 12 months of last year for, for any of the NGOs. Sorry. Nothing. Okay. So yeah. I will say that um, I will say that we had um, the manager, uh, one of the, the manager responsible for the the NGOs and specialized residential, and an analyst that works with me, uh, work together final days of the year to compare the budget for each NGO and how much they had been paid to make sure that every cent in the budget had gotten to them. We provide funding to NGOs when they provide us an invoice. Okay. And so if they hadn't provided an invoice, there was a risk that they hadn't gotten the full payment. And also, the confusion of once the budget gets passed in the House, then we can make communication to them around what their uh, New Year funding is. Sometimes their first quarter invoice is not the proper amount, and it doesn't always get caught up. Gotcha. So there was two staff working closely together, monitoring what got paid so far this year to what their budget was to make sure they got every cent before March 31st that was due. Yeah. Yeah. Charlton West Royalty, the last say, one in the set. I want to say thank you to those staff because I, I, I don't yeah. know. You're dealing with multiple organizations and millions of dollars that need thank to go you. out and it needs to be accountable for in, in, in here too as well. And uh, yeah. I just don't know where you start. And when we didn't pass the budget till, till because we, we started late because of the election, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, exactly. Difficult. So, I mean, you've yep. had a you've had a rough year, and I want to say thanks. And Thank I just all, all I'm trying to do too is just figure out to make sure what that increase was into these important services. So, can you just give me that number uh, for the increase for uh, Queens County Residential yep. Services? Uh, oh. They had six million five hundred fifty-two thousand last year. They're now going to be at seven million fifty-five thousand seven hundred, and those same two staff are working on. Um, contract amendments with the new dollar amounts yeah. started two weeks ago to try to be able to get the new amendments out to everyone and the communication of their new funding amounts. So it's good. Yeah. It's very, good. very nice. Thank you for that. Well, Larry and Verness. Uh, I can appreciate our CFO mentioned that she didn't have the authority to uh, make a decision on wage parity, but Minister, mm -hmm. do you have that authority? Um, I, I would have to have many conversations before making that decision. Um, but in the end, um, I think there would have to be uh, uh, a lot of agreement around the table uh, before before I would uh, pursue that. Yeah. O'Leary and Verness. What's the table? I'm assuming you're referring to the cabinet table. Well, actually, I'd be referring to the to the department. Oh, okay. And the, yeah, okay. And the, the NGOs and the, you know what uh, what's best. And, and I mean, certainly the discussions have been have been had. I mean, we know, we know that people are leaving to go to, to the uh, school system. Um, but we also know that you go to the school system, you get five hours work and that people are deciding, do I want to work five hours? Do I want to work 12 hours? Do I want to work eight hours? I mean, people have free will as well, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. O'Leary and Verness. No, I certainly appreciate that people have the free will and there's not necessarily something you can dictate and what works for one may not for another. So some exactly. people may choose to work a five hour shift in the school system, mm -hmm. but, but in, in the end of the day, people are making decisions and they're, in the end of the day, community inclusions or other or non-governmental organizations that hire human services workers cannot find workers and they've lost workers. So, mm -hmm. so we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I asked the question, though, when it comes to wage parity, how come the Minister of uh, uh, Health was able to make an announcement of wage parity to private uh, organizations and you aren't sure whether you can? Oh, I, I would assume there'd be many conversations around that as well. <laughs> so, you know. O'Leary and Vernice. I'm not going to oh. unilaterally um, make decisions without, without consulting hmm. the team and, uh, you know. O'Leary and Verness. No, I can appreciate you're not going to be able to make a statement on the floor of the legislature on something without a, lot, a thorough analysis of that. But would you make the commitment to say that that's a goal that you would like to see is wage parity in human service workers in non-governmental organizations uh, within the next uh, uh, completion of the contract? I will make the commitment that we'll definitely have the conversations around that. Could I add, sorry, my, could I? Could I add? Well, the chair. <laughs> you, guys, you guys have the floor. The challenge currently is that um, they're all different unions and they're all different pay rates, and it's trying to figure out how to navigate that piece. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just one second, O'Leary and Vernes. To the stranger and the minister, when they ask the questions, you, I don't need a call on, upon you. They oh, relinquish okay. the floor to you if you want to add to the minister or vice versa. Okay, thank you. O'Leary and Vernes. So, you know, I, I still go back to uh, the issue that one department was able to do that and make that statement, and it has different unions and, and maybe some of them not even unionized. Um, so a non-governmental organization, like if I take a group, I'm, I'm, I just keep saying community inclusions because I'm familiar with them, but you have a number of them across the province. Uh, you, you would think that that's something that could be worked out. Uh, I, I don't see that it would be the unions that would be the impediment to allow that to happen. Um, I understand the budgetary ramifications of that, uh, but that's, uh, that's not the workers' issue and that's not the organization's issue. They've got a problem and they, they're, they're not being competitive anymore. Um, so I think it really boils down to uh, seizing the moment and dealing with this particular issue. Uh, so, Minister, like I said before, will you make the commitment that in the next contract negotiations that there will be a, a direction to at least head towards wage parity? <laughs> <laughs> 
you, you, you're, you, you're doing well, uh, and thank you, thank you so much for standing up for your uh, community and your constituents, and uh, I will make the commitment to have the conversations. Okay. O'Leary and Vernes, the last one of your set, you managed to get an extra one in this set. <laughs> thank you. You're, you're a very gracious chair, and I might add you're, do <laughs> you're doing a good job. Uh, so when it comes to uh, the other part of this whole equation, it's not only the wage parity issue, it's also about the issue of enticing people into the profession, which usually means that they have to commence uh, taking training. So the Human Services course, I believe, is a two-year program. And once again, they are also finding competition with, once again, other government departments who have made decisions to provide free tuition to those professions. So I'm told that the pool of people applying is smaller than it has been in human services. Is there any commitment to uh, have uh, you have a conversation with the member or minister from Workforce and Advanced Learning to provide free tuition to the human services program? You use the word commitment, and I use the word I definitely will have that conversation with her, member. Thank you. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, before I go to the leader of the third party, uh, that just to let the House know, we're going to take a five minute recess. Uh, the minister requested a quick break. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, put her in a pressure cooker I'm there. Sorry. She
yeah. Okay, we're back and we are still on page 155. I have the leader of the third party up next. Um, I'm not sure. I, I had a parent reach out to me and ask me to ask this question, and I can't remember if it was something that we've talked about before. Is um, I don't I didn't see it on the on the staffing list, but is there any talk about a special needs navigator? It may oh. have been the um, children with complex needs. Mm. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I'm just. That may be through health. I'll, I'll look into that. So the one of the things that I've heard quite a bit is parents who have children living with autism, their child is now growing into adulthood. Um, and so I'm wondering is, and it might be hard to say through grants, but through the department, is there, is that a budget that is increasing? Um, that the financial supports for families with adult children living with autism? Hmm. Um, yeah, I believe that would be funding, uh, the individual would receive funding through our accessibility supports line, which is the one that's increased by 60% since 2018. Nice. Um, so. I can't say specifically for aut adults with autism, but they would be in that line. I can't yeah. say how much of that line would be attributed to adults with autism. But Fair. Yeah. yeah. And there is a children's navigator with um, complex needs with uh, health. Okay. That might have been where you yeah, heard that. I think, yeah. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that clarification. I did wonder if it was under health. Okay. Um, so the Autism Society of PEI, so they've got $100,000 can you tell me, so that's at January 31st, what would be the funding for the year? And it, it would it be an increase from last year? Uh, yes, they have 101300 this coming year. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so is that, sorry, is that 101300 above and beyond the 100000 or it's 101300 altogether? So it last, in old fiscal year, last fiscal year, they received $100,000. They asked for a $1,300 increase, and we provided the full 1300 bringing them to 101300 okay. Yeah. Leader of the third party, last one of your okay. set. Yep, thank mm -hmm. you, Chair. Uh, so the, uh, the... Stars for Life Foundation and housing. I know that that's already been discussed, and I recognize housing is mm -hmm. under capital. I'm just wondering about, because I know that that's something that, that they're a huge concern. So I'm just wondering if there's any, do you know, and perhaps you don't know through the grants, but any additional funding for the operational costs of getting new housing? Um, Does that make sense? When an NGO has a, we asked them to outline their proposal for a new home. Um, on a, like it's a two page document, we gather all the costs that they need for how they're gonna finance it or if they've, how much um, fundraising they've done or, um, and we also require the information around the operating costs um, and they present that to us and we, we consider it. Um, those type of proposals are how we solidified the 55 clients in, um, in residential, uh, sorry, in the specialized residential support line of $3 million. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Cheryl down West Royalty. Yeah, and I mean, we'll, we'll get to that. So if, if that line is in here, the residential support line, I didn't realize that that included housing so would I be all right to ask outside of the capital budget that because would that be a capital or so we it's not our capital because we do not own the homes or the assets okay so it would be their capital expenditure and we would provide an operating grant we like in our budget it would be an operating grant in their financial statements it would be a capital expenditure okay. Cheryl Town West Royalty. So is there anything specific that I can ask in the operational budget 
Um, is there anything specific for, I know that Stars for Life have submitted and done that and had land and had, um, were close to and back and forth plans. W where are we with that and how much are they going to get for, for the capital? I will need to bring that back. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm aware of it. I'm not aware of where we're at. With it. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's totally great. Yeah. yeah. Charlton, what's your Um I don't know what section. <clears throat> Community care beds would be under under your department minister. It's under the social assistance benefits line. Okay. Yeah. So it's this section. Yeah. Yeah. This section. Okay. Charlton, what's your The minister of health is said there was mention of of the long term care beds coming in. Out of those fifty four beds, were coming in. Some of those beds were were not used, but they were classed as community care beds. How many community care beds under your watch did you lose because of that move? Um, we provide funding to the individual um, in a bed. So we, it, we're structured very differently than okay. the private nursing home is where they're funding the private nursing homes. Charlton and West Royalty, last one of your set. But then I don't understand because the minister talked about having 1,600 community care beds um, just the other day. If you're providing funding to the individual, but the minister is responsible. I asked this question to the Minister of Health, and then it said to go to the Minister of Social Development. So you are responsible, Minister, of the community care beds in Prince Edward Island, and I don't understand that answer. You're, you're, re you're responsible for both the funding <laughs> towards for the individual and the community care beds. No. Who is responsible? Which minister is responsible? Then? There's 1,275 uh, community care beds across Prince Edward Island. Yeah. We supply funding for 612 clients within those beds. We just, we supply the funding. O'Leary and Burness. Thanks. I have another line of questions, but I'm going to jump off a little bit of what Charlottetown West Royalty said. And, and it was, this was another section of mine, and it, you're, you're probably quite aware. You were up, I think, and toured the Willows uh, Community Care Facility in, in O'Leary, and, and I might say a rather impressive facility. Would you concur? I certainly would. It was beautiful. Where were you that day? Well, I went earlier, I guess. <laughs> you weren't there that day. Yeah. O'Leary and Burness. Uh, anyway, what they're telling me is that there's they're seeing bigger challenges uh, with, you know, it's probably well going to be, if you're saying about half of the beds on the Prince Edward Island are going to be uh, beds that are supported by, through social services. They already are, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they're anticipating it could be 75, 80 percent of the beds could be under that. W where are you at with your contract with the community care facilities uh, in, in uh, what the, the terms of that contract are? I, that's still in negotiation. It's they're still talking. It's under There's consideration, and it's something that we've been dealing with daily. Okay. We can't. I don't have any firm details that I can share with you today. Larry Inverness. So you're saying it's expired? The contract has expired, and you're in negotiations. Is that? Yes. The, yeah. No, I'm not asking you yeah. to say what how those negotiations per se are yeah. going, but. But the fact it's how 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 long has it been expired? It expired March thirty first. Okay. O'Leary and Verness. Um, you know, I, I would assume that those negotiations are going reasonably well. But do you anticipate a uh, a uh, an agreement sometime in the near future? Are we talking a couple of months here, or we anticipate to be able to sit down uh, with them very soon. I can't speak to when the agreement will be signed because you know, it needs to be an agreement on both sides. O'Leary and Verness, last one of your set. So, uh, so you haven't even started negotiations? Is that what you're saying? That you, you will no, sit down with No, there's discussions. We haven't had one of our like full days where you sit down and each side speak. But there have been discussions. There has been a proposal. Um, we are trying to expedite it uh, because we realize that there's the agreement with the private nursing homes now. So it's very important to us. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Put me on the list again there, Chair. Leader of the <laughs> third party. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I'm flipping through my book and lost my place. That's all right. So the, I'm looking at the spinal cord injury PEI, and 
as of January 31st, that one was uh, 59,400. What would that one be for the year? Mm -hmm. uh, 61,500 in this, this new year coming. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I'm good for now. Thank you. Okay, Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, so I, I just have to go back to the community care bed. So we have twelve seventy-five, yeah. um, six hundred and twelve clients. Yes. So, um, Minister, ex explain that to me. What? What? Are you not responsible for the six hundred beds? Like, how, how? How are you as minister when you're responsible for community care beds? Only responsible for half. I just have to. Well, we fund. Okay, go ahead. You, yeah. Yeah. Um, the way it's la laid out in our act is that we provide financial assistance to the individual who needs help to pay for a community care bed. Mm -hmm. We do not uh, provide, we're, the relationship isn't with, isn't the bed. We're not paying for the bed. We're paying for the individual who cannot afford the bed on their own. Mm -hmm. Charlottetown West Royalty. But then when something comes along where there's supposedly beds that have been changed over, or the long-term care units aren't using the beds, but you're the minister responsible for the community care beds, They've been changed over. I, I'm just confused. We're about responsible that. for the individual who cannot afford that community care bed. Not all the community care beds. Yeah. Charlton West Royalty. Would that be the Minister of Health responsible for that other bed, or who is responsible under the government? I think it, it, it my understanding is they, no. they can't afford it. The new can't afford it. Sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to think of how yeah, I answer that really well. What I know is our department, and we are responsible is. for uh, helping an individual afford a community care bed, mm -hmm. not all community care beds. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. what's most important to all of us is um, the care being able to be provided. Sure, absolutely. And we are in negotiations currently, and we're looking at how we can provide the support because we realize there is an incredible spending pressures for them. So uh, it's currently in negotiations. Mm -hmm. right. Charlton West Royalty. And a great answer. That's, that's all you can do. But, but here, here's where my problem is, is that when long-term care beds, um, if you look at the public rates, uh, the, it costs 300 and some dollars for a, a long-term care bed. Private rates just went up from 250 up to 300 and 35 community care beds run at a much lower rate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there's not as much funding for a private investor to invest in the community care beds what i'm worried about is us losing community care beds to we we have to decant the hospitals absolutely mm -hmm. but we have to we have to increase our community care beds and i don't know who's looking after the community care beds so i just mm -hmm. trying to kind of explain about why i'm asking these questions and mm -hmm. minister will you work with your government to make sure that these questions are are understood and we're not losing the 1275 community care beds in our province right those are those are private beds, like right. Those are owned by. So so um, we support the 612 beds. Next month it could be 615 beds, and the month after that it could be 600 beds. We support the person that goes into the bed. What's that, uh, member? Intervention, I think. Charlottetown oh. Western Alton. Yeah. Um, so it's 612 <laughs> clients. Let's just say, how many clients did we support last year? Uh, it went, I think it went down. I think it was 5, 615, and this year it's 612, yeah, because I, I yeah. I it could be different every month. It, yeah, it could be different, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Charles Down West Royalty, last one of your set. And, and here lies the problem. Like, I'm just thinking about individuals in my area that need mm -hmm. community care. Like, just as an MLA, we see people, and we're like, well, they, they need community care. But here's, here's the problem, Minister. Um, there's a couple of people that I'm thinking about in particular need community care. They live on their own mm -hmm. in seniors housing. How, how do we get that person into a community care bed at a timely rate when they don't have anybody to advocate for them? If we're not, if we don't have the bed, we're just supporting the person. How does this person <laughs> get? Do, do you know what I'm saying? It's it's. Um, this is the situation I'm dealing with. In yeah. My area. Um, is there there is someone in particular? Yeah. Um, 
Could you read? Could we speak off the yeah. side? I'll get you yeah. in touch with someone at social programs, and they'll. I think every department over there should know because I've talked to everybody about it. So, and I've I've brought people in, and this is the disjointedness. And it's not your fault. It's not. It's, it's the no. disjointedness of government in particular. Yeah. I think not Just, yours, but. Um, the, what did you say? If if that were to come I'll up. Bring it. We'll make a contact because I know the people in the division will want to support I'd love to, that yes. individual. Thank you. We'll I'll, make I'll it happen. Talk, talk, yeah. Thank you very much. O'Leary and Verness. Uh, once again, I have a long list of questions here, but I'm going to focus a little more on what Charlottetown West Royal to keep the topic so it keeps everybody, you know, instead of bouncing around. So when I look at the budget then, so we, we just identified that your 612 uh, uh, individuals you're supporting in community care and your contract has expired. And when I look at the overall budget, once again, it's a little bit less, it's approximately the same, but a little bit less than what you spent last year. Um, I would once again think that, uh, do you think that there's going to be less people requiring supports for uh, community care facilities or more in the coming year? Um, so no, I would, I would not expect that there would be less, but once again, I'll <laughs> comment on page 153. And we've got a $162 million budget last year that's gone up by almost $15 million and is within $100,000 of our last year spend. Mm -hmm. And uh, the funding is uh, provided and appropriated to the department as the department as one number, mm -hmm. and we've um, divvied it up amongst mm -hmm. all the different spending categories. O'Leary and Burness. And, and I'll, I basically will give you back the same answer. The problem is, is that the budget's not reflecting. We, we, we're already assuming that there will be more people. And we're also assuming that that rate is going to go up for those 612. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have what it, maybe it's 15%, maybe it's 8%. But to have nothing to sort of necessarily reflect that, other than the, the hope that you're going to be able to take from another section of your department. I would rather just see a more accurate reflection on the budget lines, I guess, is where I'm coming from. So how do you explain that? Um, note taken. Thank you. Um, we do forecasts throughout the year, and that's where we weigh off our spending challenges and our underspends. And uh, they're public documents, and we report upon them. Um, and that's where we manage the total allocation to the department. Well, Larry and Verness. And I can appreciate that side of it, but you have to also understand and appreciate what we're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. here, too. So I just find it a bit str struggling to say that you're, you know, your numbers are kind of, you're admitting they're inaccurate before you even start. No, no, we're not. We are making a plan, and we're recognizing that some of the items may not spend to the same amount, and the, the exercise of the forecaster at the year monitoring the budget. Mm -hmm. O'Leary and Verness. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let that be. Uh, let's go on and look at the issue around travel and training. And I think the minister is quite aware of the circumstances in O'Leary. And, and uh, um, so it looks like you had spent 150500 last year on travel and training, and you're planning on spending approximately the same as what was budgeted, 100700 uh, I would only assume that the uh, cost of mileage and travel is going to increase. Um, so how do you how do you correspond? A, basically, a third reduction in your travel and training budget is there going to be a lot less training, maybe, or, or what's the plan there? So you're comparing the forecast spend of last year to our new year budget the forecast of 150,000 yeah. to the 100,000 budget. Um, It's not a budget line that we felt we were increasing this year. Um, we'll watch the trend and see going forward if it needs to be adjusted another year. O'Leary and Verness. But I, I find that how, how could you, I, I just don't understand the rationale behind that because I would assume that the gas is, seems to only have gone up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's certainly, and then it's projected to go up again. Uh, mm -hmm. My understanding is, is that any workers that are having to travel within uh, their, their pay based on the negotiations with the Public Service Commission, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so it just would seem to me that you're either going to have to travel less, and there's my concern, is that uh, in a rural area, which as Minister, you've been up and toured uh, social the services uh, department in uh, O'Leary, 
you know, they represent basically from Grand River to uh, North Cape, so there's a fair bit of travel there. Um, I'll understand you, you, you may give me the same line we can take from another section of our department, but to, to start with, to have basically 50,000 less <laughs> in uh, travel, seem, it seems like a number that uh, isn't realistic. So could you explain to me, is, are people going to travel less? Is gas going to go down in your estimation? Or, or is there something in the training component that you're going to reduce training for the staff that uh, require that? When we discussed the budget lines, we um, there is training that we provide that's pretty, I'm trying to remember the name of it, it's through UPEI. Um, when uh, clients are first hired, or sorry, employees are first hired to social programs, they need to take this training. Mm -hmm. Can't remember the name of it, I'm sorry. sorry. Um, and it is not uh, cheap, like it's costly training. Um, the hope is that the um, employees recruited this last year uh, will stay with us and we will not be hiring as many new to replace them that will then need to have this training. Um, mm -hmm. O'Leary and Burness. So what gives you the impression that you're going to have a be better retention of the workers that you have? If I look at uh, what I see in O'Leary, there seems to be significant amount of new faces there mm -hmm. and uh, I that's... Make that's you happy. I thought that would well, make you well, happy. They do seem happy. I, I, I'm not, you know. <laughs> but, but here's my issue is that they seem like they're from traveling up to O'Leary because mm. this is what we've seen happen in yeah. past is that people enter the Public Service Commission usually at a, mm. a rural spot and then they're, they're very keen to move on mm. to whenever there's an opening closer to where they reside. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the new faces, I'm not seeing a lot of local faces. I, I have no evidence to say that. I just, that's just my mm -hmm. uh, assumption on that. So that would tell me that you're once again going to probably be providing more training to staff as the turnover continues on that line. If I seen people that were all local faces, then you could say, well, they're probably going to stay here. Mm. And uh, so wh who's providing that training and is that a contract with a private uh, group or, or what I, is this particular I, training? Sorry, I'd need to bring back some information on that. Yeah. Larry and Vernes. Yeah, I would appreciate, I guess, getting a little more yep, details sure. on that. And I, and I, you know, I, I deal, you know, my, as MLAs, we deal with people that uh, have challenges and difficulties. And, you know, there is a, a certain way that you need to approach that mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, be uh, respectful of their challenges. And uh, so I certainly don't want to diminish the training that yeah. you're providing. But uh, yeah. once again, uh, my concern would be, I can't see that we're going to see a significant drop in that training. I'd be surprised if that training is cheaper <laughs> than it was. No. And you add in the combination that mileage, in my opinion, is only going to be, be more. Um, have you looked at the option of uh, buying vehicles for uh, staff or, and or uh, renting mm -hmm. vehicles? No. No, we haven't. And, and I... Um Member, I know you hang around Access PEI quite a bit. Well, I have an office you know, there in front you do. of the door. I know you're there, and I know you see the new faces, and I'm, I'm happy that the faces are there uh, because we're ensuring that every child in West Prince is being looked after and every case is being handled. So I want you to, I want you to know that. That's yeah. important, and it's important to you, and it's important to, to mm -hmm. us and our department. O'Leary and Verness. Uh, so therein lies, I think, as I understand, child protection, some of that's in the next that's section. Next right, so, yeah. so I, we'll have a Can't whole... Can't wait to get there. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a whole uh, segment of questions regarding, mm. regarding that okay. in the issue. But, but once again, I still go back to, uh, you know, it depends where people are based out of. So your mileage, in some cases, if you have to transfer somebody that might be based out of Summerside and they're providing services, you're, once again, you're into a higher mileage rate, right? And... Uh, so how many people do you expect that you uh, may have to do additional mileage from another location to service the people in West Prince? Well, we I'd need to take that back. Okay. Valeria well, Vaness. Okay. Uh, thanks very much on that. Uh, when it gets back to the issue, I, like I say, I, I brought up, uh, you know, with community inclusions as a non-governmental organization, and you have contracts with them. and. Uh, I think you said it's going to expire next year, right? So, uh, when they uh, when they do some services like what they're doing at, let's say, operations of Maple House, 
So that's a, a, I'm going to say it's a separate entity as such, although Community Inclusions as a non-governmental organizes it and they have staff that uh, provide support to the people who work there. If that operation makes money or, uh, you know, or loses money, I guess in either case, does that reflect in, in the budget for when they negotiate their contract or is that a complete add-on? It has no bearing on uh, what they they do. We have never reduced what we provide to a non-government organization. So if they make money, we're not going to cut what we provide them. Mm -hmm. We do look at their financial statements, and that would be reported in their financial statements when we're trying to speak to all 19 of them and their needs and allocate the funding that we're going to request amongst them all. Mm -hmm. O'Leary and Verness. But do you find that that's a disincentive for them as an organization? And I know uh, Community Connections does certain services uh, that are beyond that, and their clientele provide those services. But to me, you would be far, you should almost exclude that and let them be as, uh, as an incentive to, to try to be more entrepreneurial and also uh, support their clientele in that regard. Okay. So we do not reduce what we've provided them because they've made, may have an income in one year. O'Leary and Vernas. So, so then why is their financials a reflection of that would be a consideration? It's fiscally responsible to look at the financials Good. of an organization that we're funding. Yeah. O'Leary and Verness. And I hope they provide uh, more transparent information than sometimes we're getting here in the accurate reflections. But well, it's not very Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm just going back to saying that uh, yeah. when I look at the travel and training Gee. budget, it seems to be not really reflective of what the real needs would be. I would say the same thing with uh, accessibility supports, and I'd say the same thing with social assistance benefits. Oh. You're, I mean, you're right in saying as an overall organization and a, fund, a department you can take from different parts, and you've got a bit of a budget increase there. But as legislators, we're trying to uh, ascertain the accuracy of the budget that you're allocating and to see that the needs are going to be met. All I'm saying is, is that as we've reviewed these numbers, you've admitted in just about every, not every section, but a number of the sections here that it probably is going to be more, but we'll get it from somewhere else within the department. Is no, that I've not explained a, how. That's not fair. Uh, no, I know. That's but how she said it. So I, so I go back to the same issue, is that if, if a non-governmental organization was saying, well, we're going to take it from somewhere else, uh, it's not, a, once again, an, a reflection of what their expenditures are. So uh, like the, as an example, they could say, well, I'll take it out of the bakery or something of that nature. I don't think that should be reflective of uh, their operation. That's something that they've initiated on their own. They've worked very hard in... Uh, providing a, an entrepreneurial process within their organization and, uh, and a good service to the community. And, and to add on, it's, a, it's a, a location where a lot of their uh, clientele can work. So I would, I would like to see that. Uh, you're, you're right in saying that you, you didn't increase the budget by any means, but uh, given, or you didn't decrease the budget. I apologize there. You've given the largest increase to non-government organizations this year, 12% yep. across the board. If we met with every one of them, Mm -hmm. and discuss the challenges, and we have not reduced funding to any. Well, Larry and Vernes. But the problem is, is that their demands have increased, too. Absolutely. And the and costs of operation have them. increased, too. And, and I think everybody reason. in this province would say that their, their expenses have gone up in, in operational uh, or household mm -hmm. income. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so great. I, I, I applaud the minister to see that they've gotten and received more money. But I would also say, from what I'm hearing, they're still faced with challenges. And we, we, we understand that the challenges come from human resources. Uh, that's an issue for them, and operational costs. And I'm just trying to make sure that those people that I represent and that reside in the, in the riding I represent, that they are being treated as fairly as possible and when there's greater needs. And when a family reaches out to me and says that they, that, you know, they can't get the, the uh, supports that's a problem, right? Um, anyway, that's another story, Ms. Um, member. Yeah. Well, Larry and Vernes. Yeah, no, and, and we can. I'm not, we don't have to get into a whole lot of details no, on that. But they didn't get the any. supports that they wanted. Not saying that they should get everything they want, but uh, uh, when services were offered, they felt as a family anyway wasn't appropriate. I, you know, what am I to say about that? And I'm sure you're in the same situation, yeah. Minister. It's very yeah. difficult to analyze that. Yeah. Um, 
So another thought would be, and it really reflects back on this particular family, would be the issue around uh, respite. And, and, I, and I think it's a, it's, it's a worthy topic that I think that the department needs to look at is that we, we maybe need to uh, provide some respite services, not in long-term care facilities, but uh, in organizations like that provide housing services, that they could provide a respite where a family could get a break. And it, it falls into exactly what I'm saying in this particular family's case. Uh, do you see that's a need? And do you feel that it's appropriate that people who do get respite services should have to go to a long-term care facility? I, I think that um, our department has done above and beyond for the situation you're talking about and offered um, even to go in and do whatever they could. And, um, you know, so, um, I think that um, the department does everything they can for any individual um, that needs, that need, requires help. And um, I've seen that firsthand. And um, I can't applaud the department enough for the work that they do. Um, is it perfect? It will never be perfect, but this, this department is doing everything that they can possibly do for um, clients in need. Everything. Oh, oh, down West uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, Thank you, Minister. Um, you have to give some credit. Chair. Yeah. Um, just want to ask a few questions on, because um, this affects a lot of this section, um, and I want, I'm looking for maybe targeted <coughs> approaches. Um, in in the um, in the legislation regarding poverty el elimination in Prince Edward Island, it says um, under 18 under the age of 18 um, has to be reduced to 2018 levels by 50 percent. This is youth under 18 years of age. Minister, what are we doing, and do we have enough staff to meet those requirements? Well, we just increased our, our uh, social programs at 14.8% at um, for those who are in need. Um, and, and you know, I can list the programs that we have. We have many programs to eliminate um, poverty. Um, I can, I, and what we're doing is, is continuing to work with um, the people who, who, who require the help, who are in poverty and who, who, need, who need assistance, and that's, that's what our, our department is here to do, and, and that's what we're doing. Charles Town West Royalty. I guess the, the, uh, I'm looking for something, it's less than eight months a month away, the Private Elimination Act strategy, yeah. the, the Strategy Act is, is very, very clear. Um, and so it also says in section 3A1, uh, by January 1st, 2025, so that's eight months. Right. And every subsequent calendar year, the, the PEI poverty rates will be reduced below PEI's poverty rates of 2018 by 25% amongst all people. Right. So that, that's going to take invet targeted investments. I'm looking for what are the targeted investments that are going to allow us to meet those rates and what are the numbers? Well, that isn't, that isn't a budget question. It's not a budget question. So I mean, yeah, but but I mean, we've had some some real difficulties in the last number of years with the pandemic and with Fiona, and, and so things have changed. This poverty elimination strategy was done before that, and unfortunately, you know, so although it isn't a, a budget question, I think, I think I'll just leave it, but, but those are just some of the reasons we may not meet. Charlton West Road. Uh, so it matters when legislation was done? It matters that it was done, it, the time frame around legislation matters? Because you said it was done, it was unfortunate it was done before. This is law, are we, are we, do we have enough staff in your department to make sure that we hit these targets, which is law? Anyway, the, it, it's not a budget question. We, we have many, many programs throughout government to try and reach any poverty, any person in poverty. Um, we've increased our budget by $14.8 million. Um, we'll continue to work on poverty elimination that is not a budget question, though. So I'm not going to answer any more questions regarding that. Maybe you can ask me on the floor if you'd like. 
Charlton and West Royalty. But my question was, do we have enough staff? And how are we coordinating that? That was my question. So that is a budget question. Do we have enough staff to make sure we coordinate to make sure we're hitting these targets? So it was a simple, like I just wanted to say that it's a budget question. I'm glad the investments are there. I'm worried about the coordination of these investments. Do we have enough staff in coordinating these investments to meet, meet these targets? I can tell you how many staff we have. Perfect. I can tell you um, how many permit staff we have, and I can tell you how much staffing is in the budget. Yeah. I, I don't see the tie-in to whether or not we have enough staff to accomplish that goal as a budget goal. question. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just trying to make the link to how sure. I can relate it to budget. Um, sure, I'll down West Royalty. Uh, I appreciate that, and that's a great answer back. And I mean. We're just, I guess, once once we pass this and into law, uh, I was just kind of worried about us getting to the, like there, there's some very specific targets in, in eight short months. And I mean, when we talk about a food program that was underspent just very recently, I, I don't know. And we're not going back to that. Yeah, we're all down West Road. So did, you, did you just say the food program, the seniors' food program, was not underspent? Three hundred thousand um, dollars this last fiscal year of the two hundred fifty thousand dollars budget was spent. So it was overspent this last <clears throat> fiscal year. Charlton and West Royalty. I know. And, but, sorry, that was a previous section too. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's why I brought it back up with this. And and I, I mean, we'll we'll talk about that on the floor, obviously. And and I don't mm -hmm. want to belittle the point, but I'm just worried about, about those things. So I'll ask another question on uh, Pat and the Elephant. Uh, so Pat and the Elephant, important program. Were they allowed to, uh, the grant program, were they allowed to participate in the grant program that I mentioned before? Was that funding available to them? I'd need to bring that back. Yeah. I'm uncertain. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah I'm, not, I'm uncertain. I need sure. to bring yeah. that back. Thank you. Thing. Charlton, West Royalty, last one in your set. Thank you very much. And uh, Pat and the Elephant, again, the, the numbers, and I appreciate the answer before, uh, 298 95 and that seemed like it was for three quarters of 23 24 Can you give me the, the, the full year projection and what their grant is for next year, if possible, whatever you can give me for that? Yeah, so old year budget there, we had 325800 for them. So because the, the two staff members that worked together to make sure yeah. every NGO got their full payment, uh, they would have received that amount last year. Uh, new year budget is 392300 Thank you, and thanks for the increase to Pat and the Elephant. O'Leary Inverness. I just want to follow up a little more on that, the respite concept and... Uh, the uh, specialized residential supports, I'm assuming that's where that would be funded mm -hmm. under? Um, not necessarily. Oh, there okay. may be some there. There may also be some in the community grants line. I'd need right. to uh, do more of an analysis to be specific for you on that. O'Leary and Burness. Um, you know, my, my understanding, once again, is, is that... Uh, there are some respite supports provided by our non-governmental housing partners. The problem comes back to staffing. And depending on the level of care that's required for certain individuals with disabilities, they do not, they don't have the, once again, the, the, the budget part of it is, I'm wrong in saying, the, the budget's there. It's not competitive enough again. You're, you're into this circumstance, this so-called catch-22 where, uh, we simply can't hire people because they've taken and chosen other locations to do their work as human services workers. Uh, it, is there any way that that can be addressed on the short term, knowing that you have a contract that's not going to expire until 2025, to, to deal with those kinds of problems? I earlier stated we work with every NGO with all the needs that they have and support them. We do have a considerable increase this year for them. We mm -hmm. realize it may not be enough, and we will continue to work with them like we always have. Sure, uh, mm. O'Leary and Burness. So, so are you saying that uh, if a non-governmental organization is not able to entice uh, a human service worker to do, say, a respite care service, that you as a, would offer more money to? I'm speaking 
because I'm here to speak about budget. I'm talking about what we can do with our budget to try to support them. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get as detailed as to the exact need that they have. I can speak from a budget perspective. Mm -hmm. O'Leary and Vernes. But this is what I'm saying. It's, it is a budget issue, is that if they were, were offering a higher wage, they might be able to attract more. Uh, so I guess that's where I'm kind of coming from. So if you're working with those organizations, is there a possibility that you could offer, say, a $5 an hour bonus for somebody to deal with a, an emergency situation? Now, that, maybe that's an extreme. So but just... you're, we're talking around the same issue a number of different ways, Please. and the response will be the same. We support them. We've increased... Um, given them double the amount of the increase that we did in the Same prior year, a three, almost $5 million increase to NGOs this year. Mm -hmm. um, I can only say the same answer mm -hmm. so many times. Over and over again. <laughs> Larry and Vernes. And I'm, I'm stuck in the, I guess this is where we're in this so-called standoff, and I'm in the same situation as that, uh, you know, my constituents weren't able to get the service that they required. I'm not saying that they weren't offered other, other situations, but uh, it just needs to be something that we have to address the HR issue sooner rather than later and the wage parity issue. Those are the, the two big factors. So, so, and the minister has made a commitment that she's going to get right on that, and uh, I do appreciate that, so. Uh, that's it for me, Chair. Shelley Carey. Child and Family Services. Total Child and Family Services, 32,263,100. I have Borden Kinkora had asked a question that in another section that was related to this section. And the stranger, out of her gracious heart, has brought the answer back to you in it's this section. It's smaller. <laughs> in advance of, because the question's already been asked. So. You requested on Tuesday about the child rights impact assessment. And uh, I did need to go back and speak to the team a little bit on it. I'm used to hearing it being referred to as a CREA. Oh, yeah. yeah. So child rights impact assessments. They're assessments of policies or new programs that uh, put the consideration of the child, determine the impact to children of a new policy or program. Okay. I was hoping you'd be like, help me with the rest of the question. I think what you <laughs> wanted to know was do we do it, do we contract mm -hmm. it out, uh, or do we have staff trained to do it? Is that? Yes, that is it. You do have staff trained to do it. Impressive, thank you. Great, thank you. I had quite a team back at the office kind of <clears throat> going back and listening to your question again to make sure they had it right, so. Okay. Borden Kinkora, I'll let you start off. <laughs> well, I, I, I thank you for bringing, bringing that back, and, um, and, and your memory of it was just as good, or I'm going to dare say better than mine, <laughs> on it. Yeah. Um, I don't have those questions in front of me, but just, just to confirm, um, I, I, was there a, a, a report as, attached to that? And, and maybe, maybe the best way to do this, mm. Mr. Chair, is if I could come back and I'll find my questions. Sure thing. So I'll move on up. and I'll come back to you. What I could share with you, too, is I, I, the team back at our department had gone back and listened to what you were asking at the time, too. So what they prepared for me uh, was that uh, the, yes, we do have staff, staff who are trained to do the CREA. Uh, it's the training that is used by the Government of Canada. We do not contract this type of work out at all. It's done in-house. And um, whether or not, we, I'm not sure if you're asking us to provide some type of a report. That type of question I would need to consult again. There's a lot of privacy issues around. Right. No, I, I I, I did. I did find the question just oh. as, as you were. The, the question was simply as you've already indicated. Um, um, my question was whether there was funding. Funding. Are we funding training opportunities for the department staff to be able to do these creas, and or, or are we engaging third parties with ex expertise to complete the work? And you've you've addressed that. Right. So yes, we have staff trained, so we've paid for the training. And we would not engage third parties. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Much appreciate it. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm looking at the, the Director of Child Protection, the Director of Child and Family Services. Are both those positions currently filled? Yes. 
They are. Yep. That's great news. Yep. Okay. It is great news. What's that? We're very happy. It is very good news. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Later at third party. Thank you, Chair. I can imagine that was a lot. I think it was Jill and uh, Mike. Yeah. That it was going between so hats off to yeah, them for doing that that must it's have been fantastic. a challenge um just a quick quick question on the crea and it's not budget related but i'm wondering is the so you said we use the one the government of canada used do we modify that at all okay oh, sorry that's okay <laughs> it's not budget related so it wasn't fair to ask thank you um, third party thank you chair so i know that there's been a lot of advertising done for to encourage people to get involved as foster mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how much we're spending on that advertising campaign. We have a $50,000 budget for that, yeah. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And is that, have we, have, has it been effective? Like, has there been a big, do you have, do you have the numbers on that by any chance? Are you asking for, like, um, stats around the increase or yeah. more qualitative type statistics? It, so there, there has been some interest. I do know. I do. We just had that discussion uh, the other day. There has been some interest. People just kind of, you know, calling up and wondering, um, you know, what what the criteria is and that they might like to, and and uh, to be foster parents. And we just had a big federation in Somerset. We had a big symposium. It was wonderful with the federation of foster families. Lots of we have eighty eight right now, eighty eight foster families right now. So. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so there's been discussion. Did you get, were there new, uh, were there commitments made in any of those discussions? I don't know how many commitments were made, but there were certainly conversations had. Okay. Yeah. Leader of the third party, last yeah. one of your set. Okay. Um, so what, um, do you know what? Can you put me back on your list because I'm going to start a new line? Charlottetown mm -hmm. West Royalty. Uh, thank you very much. My, my say shout out to uh, everybody for getting that legislation in and, and yeah. through, and Mike and Jill and everybody, the whole team, Sally. Mm -hmm. um, but and I guess we'll just talk about some of the the good challenges that an expansion might might mean. You know, expansion of age, expansion of, and the first one I just want to kind of start with is a notice in here that, that uh, salaries were underspent by $1.3 million in this area, uh, which would be a lot. And But we're, we're predicting, um, from that, we're predicting uh, maybe $4.5 million. Financial, financial guess, better not look at my mathematics, but oh. these are some big numbers under salaries where we're, we're looking at, well, just, we'll start with the underspend uh, last mm -hmm. year uh, in salaries. How's that? Yeah, uh, there's a 28% vacancy rate in social workers. It's causing the underspend. Cheryl Town West Royalty. So 28% vacancy rate in social work. How many people in the department, how many, what's the complement versus how many people we have? For social workers yeah. or the whole department? For social workers. Let's start with social, social workers. workers. Um, can you tie this into budget? Sorry. We're talking about the underspend and it's being driven by the social worker vacancy. Sure. Yeah. So what, we have a 28% vacancy rate. How many people does that, how many FTEs is that? Uh, mm -hmm. 20. Cheryl Town West Royalty. And out of the increase to 24 million so we spent 20 20.6 20. million dollars last year we're looking at spending almost four million dollars more than that are all those going to be social workers and how many would that is that what we're hiring for i've got a really good answer here for that just a okay. sec <laughs> yeah um so the child and family services division have uh, a number of social workers and youth workers. Youth workers work in the group homes. Yeah. Um, so we had, in the last year, um, the team did some really good work and created an additional 33 permanent positions. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to add a million dollars to the budget for that. Um, we also had in New Year budget, we've got another 13 FTE. Um, eight of them are social workers. 
And then we've got, let me see, 13 FTE, eight social workers. Social worker. An advanced support for the Triple P and Family Ties program. Uh, three family service workers. And a disclosure custody access support person. A lot of these Shut up. new. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I did not mean to uh, cut you off. A lot of these new social worker positions are. Um, will are necessary to uh, implement the new requirements of the act of preventative measures and collaborative approaches um, uh, yeah. Charlton West Royalty. and I think those are great and we we, we uh, the, the problem becomes minister do you have a recruit recruiting strategy to get social workers now we're looking at um, we're, we're trying to we were, we're 20 short we have we budgeted for eight more um, how are we going to get 28 social workers in, in here to do this valuable work? Um, I'll speak. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> yeah, you can just go. Yeah. You, okay. Yeah. I, okay. When they ask a question, they relinquish the okay. floor to you. I okay. don't have to call All them. right. Okay. Thank you. We, we do have a, a targeted um, recruiter hired in the, for the department, so it's great. Yeah. And he's been doing some wonderful work. We've also matched incentives that Health That's PEI right. has offered to social workers um, to try to limit the competition between ourselves and Health PEI. And uh, so we're hoping to see the success from both of those um, and have better results. Good, excellent. what's yeah. yeah, and I was, I was going to say, and maybe the last one for this, side. is that where most of the social workers kind of move to is, is is health bi or the school system or what where's um can you tie that into the budget a little uh, bit more uh, please well uh, what's your all team? okay is the incentive initiative that you just mentioned enough to to draw people back to your department potentially is it a match or is it above and beyond it's the same package that they offer okay so we are the same so we should not be competing with each other about dollars anymore. It should be about the position. Okay. Yes. Sure, last one of your set. How long has that been in effect for? Yeah, like eight eight months. I need to bring back to yeah. be for certain. Um, I, see the, I don't think it's been quite a year. Okay. Thank you very much. O'Leary Inverness. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, as you're aware, you would uh, come to O'Leary, and I had raised questions in the legislature regarding the issue of child uh, uh, and family services and the lack of, uh, and in fact, you moved everybody out of O'Leary and took them to Summerside. Is there any sense from a budgetary perspective uh, how many of that, those salaries will be returning to O'Leary? Did. <laughs> So from a budgetary, can you be a little more specific of what your budget so, question uh, is? So of, of that portion of salaries of 24.615700 million, how many, how many of those, or how many dollars of those salary are going to be spent in as a whole area as a home base? How's that? What I will tell you is the, what we have uh, for employees in O'Leary is one full-time family service worker, works yeah. full-time out of O'Leary, there are two focused social workers who work part-time out of O'Leary, often with the case aid accompanying them up to three case aids. Um, there is one full-time family tied social worker that works out of O'Leary. We provide support groups for foster parents in the O'Leary office. There are five investigation social workers also out of the O'Leary offices. Um, we have a meeting room, a visit room, a storage room, one full-time office, and three offices set up for workers as mm -hmm, described mm -hmm. above. Um, the challenge is when we, a few years, in prior years, when we had positions specific to O'Leary only, we were not able to keep people in the positions. Mm -hmm. So they're currently being shared between Summerside and O'Leary. And at that has at least provided us to have some consistency yes. in the worker. And um, the re, it's very important to the children to have the same social worker. Mm -hmm. 
O'Leary and Burness. But in general terms, so there's no child protection workers that are based in O'Leary. They're, they're working from Summerside supporting O'Leary, correct? Uh, just child protection. From my notes that were prepared from, for HR because we were welcoming <laughs> this question from you. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. What I have is it's saying there is one full-time family service worker that works full-time out of O'Leary. Mm -hmm. That is not a social worker. Okay. O'Leary and Burness. And, and how is that different from a child protection worker, I guess, is where, where I'm trying to get the difference. Because once again, I, I have to admit, uh, you know, I, I don't go in the department. I, you know, I see people coming and going. But, uh, you know, my understanding is I just look at the parking lot and there's a lot less vehicles in the parking lot. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should mm -hmm. be working out of the office. They, they work out in the, in the community. Yeah. You know, carpooling. Yeah, I'm sure that's could what you, they're doing. Could you tie but, that to budget, please? So... So how, so <clears throat> what is the difference then in, in those salaries that's a, allocated to uh, child protection workers versus a family service worker? We do have that listed on our handout. I'll no. look that up for you. So family service workers are on line eight, so up to 66,000 per year and a Child protection social worker would be in the same category as social workers, so that would be, they'd be linked to the UPSI Health Collective Agreement rates to be in line with Health PEI, so they're up to 82,000, almost 900. Mm -hmm. Okay. O'Leary and Burness. So when I look at the, the budget for travel and training, this is the same issue I had in the previous section, you've spent last year 690,000 this year proposing to spend 522,800 how can you explain the decline in that because once again i would go with the argument that i would be surprised if gas is going to go down once again your arrangement with the same, same response co the contract wow well, it is the same response Valeria well, Inverness, last one of your set uh, but but there but like i said before I, I'd like to have an accurate reflection of the budget. So I know your training costs, I, once again, I'd be surprised if that changes a whole heck of a lot. And if you're not returning those workers to be based out of O'Leary, they have to travel further, and that's costing you more money, which would seem to me that budget should reflect mm -hmm. an increase on travel and training. I have the same response. Okay. Thank you. Put me uh, on the list there, Chair. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> Do we have a sense of um, how many foster parents are needed right now? Can you tie it to budget, please? Um, how much mm, more money do we need? I can tell you what we have in budget for the foster care program. Okay, that would it's, be great. Uh, $946,100. Okay. Yeah. Leader third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I'm wondering, is there any increases in incentives for foster parents here? Are there any incentives for that? That's better. <laughs> My brain is slowing down on me here. Sorry. <laughs> No, there's not this year. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So there's not this year. Have there been in the past? Is that yes, there certainly would have been in the past. I can't remember if it was last year, if there was a rate increase, or if it was the year before. There isn't this year. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So it, the incentives weren't necessary. They were based on... I'm just wondering why we wouldn't continue those, given that there's a need. Which in, which incentive are you speaking of? You ha whenever, weird, I just had asked if there were any, if there was budgeted incentives. You said not this year, but last year. I guess I'm just kind of wondering why that would be discontinued. Oh, no, no, sorry. I'm glad we confirmed this. Yeah. Nothing was discontinued. We are sa paying the same rate this year as we did last year. Okay. We did not increase. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I 
I do believe the stranger answered the question, was there any increases to the incentives? So, mm. okay. Leave it to the third party. Thank you Thank for you. that clarification. Um, is there any increases in, so I, you know what, this could be the same, we might be talking about the same thing okay. when I say yep. this, but I'm wondering if there's any increase in supports for foster parents in this budget. To the level fees, no. Okay, no. Later, the third party, last one in your set. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we've budgeted about $500,000 less for supports for children this year. I guess kind of a two-part question. What specifically are these supports and why, why were they, why is there less money there for them? So we actually budgeted $249,000 more when you compare old year budget to this year budget. The, what you're identifying is that our forecasted spend, uh, the new budget didn't increase to as much a, as forecasted spend for last year. So the budget did increase. It did increase by $250,000. About half of that is to uh, cover the cost of supporting 21-year-olds now through extended services to 25. And the other half is to provide the uh, legal supports for children from 0 to 12. Both initiatives are required through the new Act. Uh, there was also considerable new staffing that I just kind of rhymed off as well required to, uh, to keep up with the new Act. As for the grants, um, there is, we had spent, our new budget amount is $770,000 less than what we spent last year. Um, we didn't adjust it at this time because uh, we need to see how the um, collaborative approaches and the preventative measures of the new act will uh, translate into improved conditions for children. Uh, we also are recognizing that as a result of COVID and Fiona and, and different things like that, the needs that we were seeing um, were higher. So we're hoping that we will see that level off. Um, Thank you. Cheryl Town West Royalty. <clears throat> so you're hoping or is that, is there any data to support that? Um, we are, we'll, we'll be monitoring to see if this comes back to, yeah. um, or if it will need an adjustment in the yeah. next year. Uh, but we're, we're monitoring that closely. Yeah. Cheryl Town West Royalty. And I hope, I hope the same thing. I'm, mm. I'm with you. I yeah. mean, I, I just hope it was a blip and I mean, the staff there did a great job through COVID in the most yeah. part, and it was it was it was difficult, but um, that's promising, and I can hope can only hope, I guess, and that's what I was like. Any data would be would be great. Um, uh, I just want to uh, the C CPS staff, the, the Child Protection Services, do do a, do a great job. Very high demanding. More specifically, the outreach workers there. Are we fully staffed with the CPS section um, in in here? Minister. Currently, March 1st, 2024, the divisions had a 19% vacancy rate. Charlottetown, West Royalty. Would those be 19% vacancy rate, so one in five positions aren't being filled? Is that, would that be a lot of the social workers throughout the division in there, or? Could you tie this to budget, please? Thank you. What is 19%? How many, how many employees are we short? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's not that hard. I can do that. I can do, I can do a lot of things. If I can do that, that in. I, I'm just waiting to see how I can tie that into budget. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Shout down, Mr. Alti. You want to try to rephrase that one? Yeah, we're short 19% of CPS workers, Chair. Um, I would like to know, well, you can do it by region, you could do it by, by area, you could, I, I don't know how that relates. How many, what's the full complement of CPS workers that we pay for in, from the province of Prince Edward Island to develop, to uh, deliver the important services of child protection services? How are we short 20% of these workers? Thank you. So what I can perhaps provide to, to try to be helpful is of the $24.6 million budget. In our handouts, um, we provided the list of the permanent staff. Um, it's 
important to realize that there are social workers that work for child and family services and there are youth workers that work in the group home. And yeah. we are making incredible advances in recruiting youth workers. Yeah. Um, the challenge is still with social workers. Um, so the 28% vacancy rate for social workers, when you look at the division as a whole, it drops to 19% because we've been able to staff the youth workers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're supposed to be their private. Okay, we're going to, we're going to section. No. No, we can't. We're going to report progress. Yeah. I was giving you one last question. Oh, okay. Finish it up, but. Yeah. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> worried about that. CPS. Oh, we're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, Mr. Uh, chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Thank you. Shall I carry? Oh. Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole house having under consideration the grant of supply to his majesty, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I, re I move the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Carry. The member for Charlottetown Belvedere. Mr. Speaker, I call um, to the floor motion 97. Shall I carry? Carry. Motion number 97 in support of the UPI School of Medicine. Debate was adjourned by the member from O'Leary Inverness. The member for O'Leary Inverness to continue debate. Uh, thank you, Chair. Maybe I'd like to get the podium. I'm kind of a little stiffened up here. Th uh, thank you, uh, member from Surrey Elmira. Your very gracious colleague. Yes. <laughs> you understand the Pass role. that gingerly, member. <laughs> How's that, honorable member? Very appreciative there, uh, <laughs> my colleague, honorable colleague from Surrey, Elmira. Uh, anyway, thanks. Uh, I certainly was in discussions on uh, speaking to this particular motion. And like I said earlier on, I come to this motion with a, a little different perspective in the respect that I was a former minister uh, of health. And uh, like I say, any, anything can be accomplished if you throw enough money at it. And uh, my big concern, as I had outlined earlier on, that I was quite concerned about the cost effectiveness of this investment and what we get in return for the money that we are invested. And uh, I have some grave concerns about the impacts that this is going to have on our existing uh, health system, uh, you know, we we are, you know, I think we we as a province are uh, unaware of how how the, our process would work on this. We you know the situation around the residency program, the situation around the preceptors that we have to provide, the costs of uh, uh, more space that we would have. Uh, we're still baffled, and we can't seem to get a, any sense of clarity. Uh, whether the existing seats that we have in Dalhousie, Sherbrooke, and uh, Memorial are all going to be in place and how that interacts. We haven't been given a lot of clarity to that. We have been informed that uh, Dalhousie is going to be dropping its uh, uh, seats uh, to Prince Edward Island in a, in a few years. And uh, yet we don't have a lot uh, confirmed on the new school that's going to be happening here at UPEI. I've always said that I knew that they won't have a big issue finding staff for it. That's not, not a concern. You give people enough money, they're going to come to those positions, uh, deans and things of that nature. The issue is where do they come from and where, you know, what your, uh, 
the competition is going to be. And I, I've made the statement in this legislature many times, there's unintended consequences. And I, I was quite uh, uh, complimented by the fact that the Premier used my, my line on unintended consequences. He listens to some of the things I say. A uh, little disappointed that he called my bill a tractor bill versus a, a farm vendor's machinery act repair bill. But that's, that's fine. I, I'm, I don't have necessarily a problem with that. Uh, and I, like I say, I was doing a little bit of the math, and once again, we, I haven't necessarily got a confirmation whether we're graduating 15 students or 20 students. I've heard both numbers. I'm not sure what others have had in this house, and maybe there'll be somebody that will verify that. But I think those are, are key components of uh, uh, making a decision on, a, on a, an expenditure of this nature. Uh, you know, I do know that we have uh, seven residency spots currently. Actually, I think we have actually six and I or five, and I think they're adding two more. Um, but uh, you know, you still got to wonder where where the other 23 <laughs> residency uh, positions are going to be held at. Because they say if you're graduating 15, that's 30 people that are going through residency. 15 a year, two years, 30 30 positions and yet we have seven. So where are the other 23 going? Now I'm going to go with some assumptions that uh, you might add a few more to the complement here in Prince Edward Island, but the rest of them are probably going to be, have to go to another province to do their residency. And uh, for everybody that uses the analogy, oh, it's where they do their training. It's not. It's where they do their residency is where they're more apt to, uh, that province that they do the residency is where they're more apt to uh, uh, continue on in, in, in the services they provide. Unless you're doing something where you're offering way more money than everybody else. If it's, if it's a competitive factor, you, you'll attract people. But I go back to saying, you know, in the Minister of Finance, you've got a deficit, a massive deficit. You've got $300 million that you're paying just an interest to service the debt. That's in the budget statement. So, so that's a lot of money. So uh, you know, those are, those are the, where I have, I have concerns on how much you're going to increase the debt to provide this service. And I know the Premier has made the statement, there's, he has all the money in the world to throw at this. And uh, I, by no doubt the way his spending habits are, I don't think that's, I don't deny him that ability and I'm quite confident he would fulfill that uh, obligation. But, uh, but I do feel that if you don't have the residency spots to support a medical school, the likelihood of continuing and getting the payback on people is, uh, is pretty, uh, pretty limited. So that's where I'm saying, are we spending all kinds of money and training people for another province? And, uh, and I guess that's a good thing too if we are doing that. I, I mean, in the end of the day, more doctors, wherever they go in Canada, is, is helpful, but as a uh, resident of Prince Edward Island, I'd like to know that my tax dollars are going to something that uh, provides me with some value back. Uh, and I'm going to get some benefit of that, those decisions that the government makes and that the services that they provide. Um, the, other, the other big issue that, I, that I've said I, I have concerns about will be accreditation. Once again, I think if you have enough money, you can probably resolve that issue. But, you know, you're taking the curriculum from Memorial, and that, that's fine. That, we'll say, is, is solid. But accreditation is based on more than just the curriculum. It's based on the level of uh, competency of the, the uh, staff. It's based on uh, the, the training that they get when they go out onto the, the job, or doing on-the-job training as, with their preceptors. It also has a component of the residency. So, so that's a whole other issue that I have questions about. I, like I said, I you throw enough money at it, probably you can probably resolve that. But here's the big one that I have concerns about: is that if you have if you have uh, these preceptors, you're going to have about uh, 60 grads at some point in time here, or it's not 60, 60 in the school at one time, four-year program, 2015 or 2015, I guess is what I was told. So that makes 60. Um, do those doctor or those people have to work with a preceptor or a doctor for a, some period of time. I don't know how many weeks that they do that, but it's a, a period of time that they're going to be dealing with that. 
And that's where the, the rubber hits the road here. It's the, that's where 15 to 25 percent productivity of the existing physicians or the resident doctor that they are with is reduced in providing a level of service to support those students. And if you're not providing the appropriate supports to the accreditors, you may not get a, accreditation or you get accreditation with qualification. And, uh, you know, uh, that, that's where a, a concern that I, I really have. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it needs to be spoken. Somebody from this legislature needs to confirm whether we are going to, where the existing seats are going to be maintained or not. So if you, if you have seats in Memorial, Dalhousie, and Sherbrooke, and you're going to eliminate them or part of them, well, then now all of a sudden you're not really adding a whole pile more doctors to our system. You know, so, uh, so if you're gonna, only going to add four or five more doctors actually to the system, if you eliminate those other seats, now all of a sudden you're, you're, left, uh, you're left with uh, a whole pile of money for an institution and all the, the staffing and the wages and supports that goes with that, and you're only getting a few more doctors. It's, it's got to significantly move the bar here, and in my opinion, government's going to have to really address the issue of residency and the preceptors and how you provide and deliver a service to 180,000 plus islanders, maybe it's going to be heading for 200,000 in the near future, uh, how are you going to provide a level of health care service to those uh, people who require those services. And I, I know statistically you can sometimes argue that we're getting younger as a population because a lot of people have moved here, but the number of people that are in the, the seniors category are are increasing regardless. May not be the same percentage from an age perspective. And, you know, the hard real, reality and facts of uh, healthcare delivery is that the older, more older elderly people you have, the more they tend to require services. Like you they say when you're an infant to, uh, and then when you're a senior are the two points that you really uh, need the healthcare system. And, uh, you know, we're already struggling with the amount of beds we're trying to add into the system. We've made a decision to uh, change the complement, and I really question that. I, I, I understand. I, I was faced with that as a minister many times, too. Now, we never, we always had vacancies, so it wasn't a really big issue. But, uh, but in the end, I think that's going to be a uh, deterioration of delivery of health care services in rural communities. Um, I can think of the time that, uh, and this is something I think the media totally disregarded about the issue around the complement. The issue around the complement is, is if a doctor has a panel in, say, Western PEI, which I run into in this particular case, and that physician says, I'm just going to go set up in Summerside. And he sends a letter out to all his patients. I'll, you can see me in Summerside. Well, I guess, you know, the, the positive in that, you still have a physician and you just have to travel to Summerside for him. But here's what happens. Now, all of a sudden, that physician has, he's living in Summerside, he's not providing a service to, say, a rural community, and then he's not able to then provide the, the uh, supports to the institutions that we have in those rural communities. So if you're talking long-term care beds, you have to have some coverage by a physician in long-term care. You have to have coverage in emergency rooms. You have to have coverage uh, in the hospital beds that uh, people are admitted to. Said it before in O'Leary, we have 13 acute care beds. Services like palliative care, restorative care, and convalescent care that works perfectly in the system. And I believe Colville Hospital is sort of, in Surrey is sort of similar. So, we, but you still have to have the, the supports for that. And, uh, you know, if you don't have a physician that's willing to cover that, then that, that becomes a problem. And that can also have an impact on accreditation, not only for our medical school, but it has an impact on the accreditation of your overall health system. People have to understand that your, our health care system is accredited every so often. I'm going to say I think it's a five-year cycle, but uh, it sometimes can be sooner than that. If you, if you have qualifications on your accreditation, it may mean you get a one year and you have to be reassessed again. And it's a big deal, accreditation. I went through it once as minister. It's a really big deal. And, uh, you know, there's you know, staff supports from, from the department, the health PEI. Everybody's trying to look at what the, the new uh, benchmarks are for health care delivery in, in a province. And uh, it's quite encompassing. It's not only the acute care. It's not only the emergency room. It's not only doctors. It's not only addictions. It, the list goes on. And you have to 
comply with that. And there's health accreditors from all over Canada. They come and they assess your and give their recommendations and uh, you try to abide for them. If I think in the O'Leary Hospital, we had a few challenges and I think I brought them up to the, the minister uh, of, uh, from, that represents Albert and Bloomfield and so I don't know if they've been much been done on them. One of the, one of the issues was, was uh, the storage facilities within the hospital. We did not have an appropriate uh, level of control over supplies in the hospital. That was identified as a, a gap in our, in our accreditation model for healthcare in O'Leary. And uh, it seemed to be totally disregarded. <laughs> I, I hope that by next time it's accredited, uh, that will be resolved. I'm not overly confident at this point that it will be, but uh, there was a plan at that time to uh, how we could deal with it. Uh, was about uh, encompassing the island EMS uh, ambulance depot into the hospital area and building a piece on. Now that comes with big budgetary issues. And uh, the former minister at the time made the commitment to, to the foundation. I will be providing those services. And I would say that, M Mr. Speaker, we're also going to have to provide, if we're going to do some uh, preceptor work or have a resident physician there, we're going to also have to provide the space at the O'Leary Hospital. Because we'll assume that, you know, we'd, at least we'll get one resident physician uh, at a seven. There's uh, the hospitals that's out there. So, uh, there was a chance to deal with all of that issue. And when I informed the, the hospital foundation that uh, nothing was in the capital budget, well, <laughs> there were some meetings held pretty quickly. And anyway, in the end, the minister made some commitments that he would try to do something for them. But anyway, so far I'm not aware, well, not that anybody necessarily has to inform me or is informing me what's going on in the district, but that's uh, what I, what I know of in that. So, uh, so that's where you, you're going to have to deal with those types of issues when you're dealing with the residency program that's affiliated with the medical school. And uh, it's going to come with a big ticket item. And I know the Minister of Finance, oh, cha-ching, cha-ching, when does this ever end? <laughs> you know, so, so I think that's the type of stuff that you have to, to look at. It's, it's those unintended consequences and it takes from one that impacts another. And uh, uh, you know, when it comes to the review, I see, I, see, I was reading the, the tender page, Mr. Speaker, and I noticed this is a health review of the Prince County Hospital, Community Hospital area, and Western Hospital, a review. Now, what does that mean? You know, I'm still, to, I don't know what that means. I, I, I would have said in O'Leary's case, it's working quite fine, but that tells me that there's going to be some decisions made that, uh, uh, that are going to impact how the three facilities interact. And I think they should interact. They're, they're, it's like I look at uh, the hospitals that we have, uh, QEH and, and uh, Montague, Kings County, and the, and the one in Surrey, uh, that you, uh, they all kind of interact and they try not to overly duplicate each other's services. I think there's always some uh, duplication. But I, I like the concept that we have in O'Leary where we are providing palliative, convalescent, and restorative care. And you have all the the support services around that from physiotherapy, occupational therapy, uh, long-term care, respite supports, uh, and uh, uh, people who get, the, like I say, the convalescent services so that they, when they have a surgery at Prince County Hospital, uh, that they can go convalesce in O'Leary, at least the ones that are in that more western geography area, and that they could get the residency supports as well as they can get the medical school to be able to uh, provide those uh, uh, supports and, uh, and uh, adjudications and judgments on how to deliver health care services. But if you're, now we're talking about possibly taking the intensive care supports out of the Prince County Hospital, and they're doing a review of this, so that tells me that they may be saying that we don't need res, uh, those supports, and then what impacts does that have or unintended consequences that it has in O'Leary? Because if people aren't having the surgeries in certain locations, maybe they don't need the convalescent care. So. We need to get that figured out. Uh, you know, how much money uh, of, uh, for the implementation of uh, this infrastructure is going to be required? Uh, you know, I, I, I look at just the medical school. I think I was looking at some numbers there. The province committing $125 million to that. And I think UPEI is $10 million, And UPEI, uh, most of that money is coming from the province too. You know, uh, and uh, I think we're also providing uh, another $66 million for the operational cost uh, for the first six years. That's $10 million a year. Uh, that's some pretty, pretty 
big ticket item, <laughs> you know, from what I what I'm seeing, and I you know I really question on how how valuable this is. And then when we see the issues of, uh, you know, the medical society certainly wrote a letter that they had concerns. Uh, I, I know I I was probably not very uh, good to uh, the former. Uh, uh, CEO of Health PEI, I, I did dub him the big city health guru that the uh, Premier brought in, but he had concerns. And I did, I did have a lot of respect that he was outspoken. Uh, I, uh, you know, would say that, uh, you know, he, he was given a pretty bad deck of cards to try to uh, figure this stuff out. You know, so when I look at our health care budget, it, you know, it's $1.125 billion. <laughs> like that number, Minister Finance? <laughs> And I was Minister, uh, minister of Health, and, uh, you know, we're trying to, uh, you know, the then Premier would say, well, you know, we've got to manage this better. We gotta, I think his line was, you've got to, you know, pull, pull on the reins there, uh, Minister. <laughs> and I kept saying, well, how do you do that? Because people are, keep coming in. We've got an older population. It's pretty hard to deny anybody any potential services. And, uh, you know, so, so these, are, these are big ticket items. This is a big portion of money for a province of 125 million and you're going to add on another 125 million 10 million to UPI and another 10 million a year for uh, another uh, six years and I'll probably eat my hat as the saying goes if that stops after six years <laughs> so so I rarely see anything that we uh, say we're going to support for a period of time uh, ends so when we add in inflation and uh, the extra costs, it, this, this is a runaway train. You've you, you got to keep feeding it, the, putting the cash on board to keep it going, keep it running. And, uh, you know, like I said before, I made the statement, interest on the debt is $300 million for PEI. I add in, the, think of this, the federal transfers. Province of PEI, $1.125 billion. Basically, that's our health care system. But... I, I, I've said this before, and I know a lot of these members on the other side, they're big fans of uh, Pierre Poliev, the next, the second coming of Christ, I think he is, but <laughs> uh, the way they talk. But anyway, and how, ha, how they bash Justin Trudeau. And I'm not here to defend Justin Trudeau by any means, but I'm going to give a pretty good guess that Pierre Poliev is not going to be transferring $1.125 billion to the province of PEI. Say yeah, that's, that's my take. And like I said before, that's when the dynamic, the whole dynamic changes in you guys. The, and they, every one of them know it. <laughs> they smile and grin. <laughs> but but that, that, I've been there, done that. I've seen this happen. And, uh, you know, so that, those are some big challenges that are coming forward. And I've said this before when it comes to the cost effectiveness of things is that, uh, you know, the Minister of Finance is when you're free financing your, your debt, long-term debt as it comes, uh, uh, you're probably going to be uh, signing off on it at a higher interest rate than you had when you locked it in. Those figures are going to come home hard. Yep. And, and, I, and I've seen it. I've seen, like I say, first thing, the bond raters show up. Oh, there are quite a bunch. <laughs> Poor's and standard pours and that group, they show up. <laughs> And the first thing they do is they look over your budget statements. Yeah, <laughs> the Minister of Finance is acknowledging all this. <laughs> and uh, like I say, we've been going through the budget estimates here, and like I say, it, it, it's, it seems like a little bit of a cat and mouse game itself on that. I mean, the budget numbers, they're the same as last year, but we know mileage, and we know that the people needing accessibility supports is going to be a lot more, and I would say the people on the need for health care services is only going to increase. There's nothing's going to go down. <coughs> But yet your budget reflects that. So your budget deficit, the only thing that saves you is the staffing. If you can't fill the positions, you save, you save some money there. And that's, you know, so that, that puts you in a very precarious situation. So they all of a sudden, they say to the Minister of Finance, you got a medical school you're spending a whole pile of money on. You're going to have to support it for the next six years. You've got all these commitments. And you're going to... Uh, your interest rates are coming higher, and oh, geez, we've got Pierre Poliev is in, in Ottawa now, and he's cutting back. He's cutting the budget. He's not going to even meet with the provinces, is my guess with him. Or if he does, it'll be all with Alberta and Saskatchewan. And that little old PEI sitting there wanting to wonder what the money's going to come from. 
And then all of a sudden, the Minister of Finance got to go to the Department of Health, and they got to go to the Department of Agriculture. They got to, you got to cut, you got to cut four percent of your budget. You got to cut five percent of your budget. What's that look like? <laughs> oh, it's a fun day. <laughs> Went through it. Now I was able to, lucky enough, to serve up a buffalo or two <laughs> at uh, the odd park, <laughs> and I, I kind of squeaked, squeaked by it. Literally, <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> And, uh, but, you know, those are the days that governance becomes difficult. And uh, then, then you come out and you make the decisions and you make the announcements that, gee, I, I had to give up the Buffalo Park and I had to give up Green Park and I had to give up a few different things. And we tried to, what's the plan and how we can at least keep them but not have to have them on the government books. That's what happens, Minister. And uh, so you have to be very careful on how you spend and, and support the initiatives that you're committing to. And, uh, and, I, you know, and I'll say times are far different today than they were then. I mean, we, we used to have a media and we used to have reporters that really would grill you on a question that today is gone. You know? <laughs> but, you know, I would go to the, to the public and I would go meet with them. And so when, the, when a community was upset about the issues around, uh, I'll say, the Buffalo Park or, or the decision to uh, change the uh, Tyne Valley Hospital to a long-term care facility, stood there in front of people and, boy, they give it to you front and center. And it's not fun days to sit there. But I always said I had the courage to do that and to face the people and uh, take it on the chin but I always tried to say I was going to explain to them the rationale behind the decision and uh, at least answer the questions. And, you know, I, I say eventually you know, your popularity as a government tends to decline and people have different priorities. Uh, but, uh, but in the end, you, you have to make decisions and you have to deal with the issue of dealing with the bond raiders. And I know everybody put the bond raiders, but the bond raiders turn around and say, I'm changing your... Uh, uh, your debt uh, issue to say that your interest rates now have to be able, your bond, your rating, uh, credit rating is going to go, it's going to change, it's going to be downgraded. And that changes your interest rates. <clears throat> and your interest rates, what you might have is, is you know, oh, the government gets a low interest rate, but you, you try adding a quarter percent onto your overall debt, right? That's a big number when we're, all of a sudden we're, we're servicing the debt at 300 million. 300 million dollars. Phenomenal number, really, for a population the size that we are. So, 600 tractors. Well, think of the tractor bill, and then, but you can't get them fixed anymore because the dealers won't probably fix them <laughs> in future, not today. But, so, you know, I'm just saying that's the stuff and that's the issues that I have when it comes to the issues of support, you know, on this particular motion on a medical on a support in UPI medicine. I know it can be done, I'm not disputing that. But in the end of the day, it has to be justified, and you have to be able to afford it, and it has to fit in with where your, your needs are. I'm just saying that there were options that were probably more uh, cost effective and that would be more able to meet the needs. And I would have proposed to say more residency spots. That makes a lot of sense. I don't know if we can do many more, but once again, we haven't determined yet how many people are graduating from this program and, and uh, how many residency spots you actually have. And once again, I think the other big factor is if you're stopping your seats in your other institutions, Memorial, Sherbrooke, and the Dalhousie, uh, you know, your net gain may be not too much here. And for the money you're putting out, that, that's where the factors that you, you have to, to deal with. And we see doctor shortages in Prince Edward Island, but and, you know, I, I've looked at these numbers, the CHI-HI numbers, Canadian Institute of Health Information. And uh, I, I said during my time as minister, I did look at those, those numbers. And PEI usually consistently would be between 8 and 10 out of 13. Now, not, not, not great numbers. I'm not saying by any means that as a minister I changed the health care system. But I, I keep saying I, I hung in there. <laughs> I, kept it, I kept it to at least a level that was consistent during my two years. Now, I know there's been four ministers of health since me, and there's only been one that served longer than me. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's a short, uh, short uh, career and uh, a lot of burnout in that, that portfolio. So if any minister gets that call, <laughs> I, I shudder to think what the decision you're going to make. I, I'd say you've got to take it. There's not much you can do on it, but it's, uh, you'd have to question whether the premier really likes you very well.
You weren't, you weren't a big uh, supporter of him during the campaign. I'm thinking if you got that, that portfolio offered to you. Uh, so, you know, when you look at the burnout that we're occurring in our physician uh, complement, but the fact that we are now dead last, we're 13, we're 13 out of 13 in just about every statistical. Remember from Rustico Everill, what did you suggest? I said you put our best people in those. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. that's, yeah. that's the liberal ways to put for the people you don't like. That. Well, that, well, I'm just saying what I'm seeing, they didn't last very long. All I'm saying I lasted two years, and I, I think one of the, my predecessors lasted a little, little longer than that. But <laughs> it, it, that's, a, that's a tough portfolio. And, and, I, and I'll tell you what I found about it when I was Minister of Health is that uh, I have to, just so you know, the Minister of Health doesn't get any extra money. The salary's the same as every other portfolio. <laughs> and uh, I can remember traveling to Charlottetown, and I get a call from one of my colleagues uh, from Albert and Bloomfield, and uh, he was a minister too. And, uh, what are you doing today, bro? <laughs> well, he was going off on some nice, nice adventure to check out a business or something, and I was going down to meet with the Hemorrhoid Society or something, you know, so I was, <laughs> I, I had a tough day, I was having a tough day. <laughs> so, so, you know, these are the types of things that you can run into uh, in, uh, in being a Minister of Health, so, uh, so I'm just saying, as what I have seen in all my time in this, uh, that portfolio, uh, I'm really questioning how you're going to be able to deliver a medical school here in Prince Edward Island uh, uh, at a cost-effective way. Like I said, I'm, I'm quite confident that we have people here, good people in Prince Edward Island, and I'm quite confident that uh, you know, they'll do their level best, but it's all going to come with money. Yeah. And it's going to come with lots of it. And uh, I, would, I would try to emphasize that the current Minister of Finance, if you have any legacy at all, you need to make sure that you uh, leave Prince Edward Island in a, you know, a little bit better situation than $300 million of interest payments on the, the current debt. And I don't see how you're going to do that and accomplish that uh, with uh, the situation that we are with adding into the medical school. Yeah, I don't think you've even scratched the surface of the cost of what this is going to be. Because when we get into it, you see it in every project. I see it. All, I think it was the I heard the news of the Trans Canada pipeline or something. It already cost way more than what they originally thought. I'll bet the medical school will be in that same category, like any other uh, project. They rarely come in on budget and on time. And we've already seen delays that the the medical school has had. Uh, they postponed it a little while longer. Uh, the medical society has suggested pausing even a little bit longer. And, uh, you know, you, you have to try to see what you can do to come up with the, uh, the solutions on dealing with that. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, you really got to think about this. And I, I certainly don't have the confidence that this particular government can deliver on it. Uh, I know they'll try their best. And, and, they, and whenever they're criticized, they lash out. It's never a real good debate that they're... they're lashing out that, you know, you're negative on this or you're negative on that. Well, opposition does have a role to highlight uh, some of the, the challenges that are faced with any particular endeavor or project that government puts on. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I, and I know the other part of it is as island students. You know, I know we want to try to provide, provide support for our island students that apply for medical school. But I think we can, we can support that. Uh, you know, if uh, in different ways, and maybe part of that would have been uh, the residency uh, option. See, another thing that we have that's out there that's really important, we have a lot of uh, islanders that get, are trained in other institutions. I know there's a, a number of physicians were trained down in Antigua. I think that there's a, a medical school down there. It's called SABA, I believe is the acronym. But, and uh, fantastic physicians that come out of that. And uh, a good example, I, I, I had a constituent that uh, completed medical school down there. And uh, we only have one residency spot that's for a uh, foreign trained physician, even though they're Islanders. And she didn't get that, that position. So she wound up going, I believe, to New Brunswick. And uh, I think that's where she's still working. Um, so you know, I, I just think that there was, a, there was an option there. You could have somebody else train them, and we could have put a resident, extra residency spot and achieved very comparable with 
a fraction of the cost. Maybe we could even have bought seats at SEPA, or maybe we could have bought more seats at another institution. Uh, you already have uh, Dalhousie saying it's going to look at an expansion. Maybe we could have looked at that as an option. But we didn't. We didn't look at any of those options. We, we have a vanity project that the Premier wants to get his name in the cornerstone uh, of a medical school. And uh, wish him all the best. Hope he gets it on there. Uh, and he probably deserves that. I'm not disputing that. I just wonder in, in 10 or 15 years' time if it has fiscal challenges and been able to deliver that, or there's a whole lot, bunch of other programs that are cut because of this decision, like I said previously to the Minister of Finance, uh, you know, that's the, is, is the net gain here worthwhile? And uh, so that, that's kind of my, my sort of take on it, uh, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I certainly am struggling to support this motion in, in that regard. Uh, and uh, you know, when it says, therefore, be resolved, the Senate support the uh, establishment of a UPI School of Medicine as a long-term step towards increasing the number of doctors and trained. <coughs> My struggle with that is, is that how do we get there? Yeah. If, if in a magic world everything was all put in place and it was graduates and we had all the supports in place and we were still able to aptly deliver uh, services to Islanders, uh, that's, that's a growing population that's also seeing an increase in uh, Aging, an aging population, uh, that's the problem that I have with it. Like I say, I think it can be done. I'm not, I'm not disputing that, but it is a cost effective. So, so with that, um, unless there's further debate uh, occurs, uh, I will not be supporting the motion. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Speaker. And there will be further debate. The member for New Haven Rocky Point. Well. May I have the the? Oh. Uh, yes. Thank you, my friend. Oops. Perfect. So, for, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I want to I want to give credit to the member who just spoke. I mean, I I don't think I know anybody else who could somehow squeeze the words Buffalo, Christ, and hemorrhoids it's into the same speech <laughs> on a medical school. I mean, that was. It is a gift. I, I figured the last one is the reason why he was standing up. He just couldn't sit down. Yeah, but, <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, despite the levity, this is a very serious motion, and it's, uh, I've been waiting some time to, to stand up and speak to this, and I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to do so. Uh, I'd like to go back, uh, actually right to the beginning, when the mover and seconder spoke to this. It was a week ago, actually. Uh, exactly a week ago today. And uh, the MLA for Charlottetown Belvedere spoke very eloquently uh, on the establishment of a uh, medical school here and used the metaphor of the Confederation Bridge, uh, the iconic monumental structure that, that was built here 20, 30 years ago, and how she felt that the establishment of a medical school was sort of equivalent to that. And I, you know, I'm a, I love a good narrative, and I, I, you know, I find that very poetically interesting, but, but logically very disappointing. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, Confederation Bridge, uh, you know, we, we, that was something that was contemplated for well over 100 years. Um, back in the terms of uh, Union in 1873 when we joined Canada, it was the very first term of union was that we would have a continuous year-round connection with mainland back then. It was steamships, of course. But very shortly afterwards, there were suggestions that we should also consider um, a, a, a permanent fixed link. Uh, and a bridge was the, I'm sorry, a tunnel was the first thing that was suggested. And back in the 1950s, a, a causeway was considered, and actually they started to build the, the approaches to that. You can still see them. Um, and then, of course, we had Confederation Bridge, which was uh, opened not that very long ago. And the difference between the arrival and construction of the Confederation Bridge and the arrival and construction of our medical school, well, there's so many differences. 
Firstly, I don't think the civil engineers, this speaker, you, you would, I don't know if there is a specialty of bridge engineers, probably there is, but I suspect that the, 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 the civil engineers were not opposed to the bridge being built. However, we do know that the equivalent specialists here on the island, the doctors, through the medical society and many, many, many conversations that I've had, which go far beyond the anecdotal at this point, the medical community here is concerned about the establishment of the medical school. The second thing is that there was widespread and prolonged debate on the building of the bridge. All voices were heard. There were folks who were for it. There were folks who were against it. And none of them was ridiculed. They were all given an opportunity to say their, say their, their piece. That hasn't happened here. Uh, one of the things that I find so distressing about this polarized argument, polarized debate, well, I said argument. I mean, that's really what it's, what it's devolved into, sadly. But the fact that when you express concerns, whether they are some of the concerns, and I would echo what my friend from Alarian Burness was just talking about, the, con the financial concerns at attached to the school, that's, well, that's one aspect of it. The impact it's going to have on our existing medical uh, system here. Uh, how are we going to deal with that? Uh, the concerns about whether we are going to actually have enough residency positions to service the graduates that come out of the school. The impact that the school may have on the university itself, there, is, there are many concerns. The long-term viability of this, we just have not seen. I mean, when they built the bridge, for goodness sake, they, th there were some very, very detailed plans drawn up. There were long-term costs associated with it. There were various options that were considered. And we all knew where we stood when that was, when the, the agreement to build that bridge was finally signed. That's certainly not, not the case with the medical school. We, that, though, that sort of copious amount of research that went into the bridge, none, none of that exists for this medical school. Um, we haven't yet seen full costing. We haven't, we haven't yet seen a business case for the school we're not, we don't know what other options were considered. Like all, all of this was absent in the building of this medical school. And then of course, before the bridge got built, not only did the politicians have their word, but islanders had their say as well. We had a plebiscite in 1988, uh, which passed you know, fairly handily. Um, but my gosh, that was a divisive debate. Now I, I say this without actually being a resident of the island at that time, but I, from afar, um, I watched with great interest and I'm, I have some sense of just how, uh, how heated that debate got. But it was a debate. People got involved. People had their say. People were able to express concerns without, without being told that they were being partisan. Um, it, it was a, just an entirely different thing altogether. And while, of course, I am delighted today, um, went across the bridge earlier this week. Um, and it's so easy, so convenient. And I presume none of us can actually imagine uh, living life without it now. It would be very, very difficult to do that. And of course, that's, that's been wonderful. Um, but the, the future of the PEI, UPEI Medical School is much less certain. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to my concerns about that shortly. Um, when Charlottetown Belvedere sat down, and again, it was a very eloquent, very spirited uh, uh, mo m mover of the motion, um, Surya Almira took over and, and actually talked about some of the, uh, some of the concerns that he had. Um, and I, it was a week ago, so I mean, I'm, I wouldn't expect us all to, to remember exactly what was, what was said at that time, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of what Surya Almira said was around, the, um, uh, around partisanship. Um, and if I remember right, he said at one point, this is, oh, I can't remember exactly what you said, but I would, I would 
proffer to you that this is absolutely not a partisan issue. Uh, I think when you have the medical society, when you have leaders from Health PEI, when you have board members, board chairs from the Health PEI, when you have physicians themselves, when you have a faculty association at the university, <clears throat> all saying that there are potentially some very serious concerns with this school, none of them saying shut her down, none of them saying press the abort button, but many of them saying we need to press pause here and consider this just for a moment. Then this very much ceases to be a partisan issue. <coughs> it is the responsibility of those of us who sit here as opposition members <clears throat> to hold government to account. And a large part of that is holding government to account for the spending of public dollars. <clears throat> and as uh, O'Leary and Verdes just said, and, this, and the folks who spoke last week, Charlottetown uh, West Royalty, and the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, um, there were some very serious concerns expressed um, about the financial aspects of this about the spending of public dollars, and, and I would absolutely concur and echo those, because we don't... <coughs> thank you, thank you. We have yet to see a business case for this. We, we saw studies that were produced after the fact, after the shovels were in the ground, which of course is in direct contrast, direct and worrying contrast, to the promises of shovel and shovels in the ground that we heard five years ago for the mental health campus, and uh, we're still waiting to see large swaths of that. <coughs> but when it came to the medical school, shovels were in the ground before we had full costing. Shovels were in the ground before we had details on what the school was going to look like. Shovels were in the ground before we had a business case done. Shovels were in the ground, I believe, before all other options were considered. So to paint this as a partisan issue <clears throat> is, I think, deeply unfair. People way, way outside of the rail here who probably have little or no interest in politics itself are saying, wait a minute, there are, there are some real serious concerns that we, that we should be dealing with and thinking about here. And I think it's absolutely possible to harbor reservations um, about what this school may look like, but also recognize the potential benefits that it may bring long term. Absolutely, I do. <coughs> this, is, this, is not, um, this is not an issue of either yes or no. It's an issue of getting this right and making sure that with this amount, of public this amount of public dollars that are being spent, that we do it properly. <coughs> and Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. That is where the heart of my concern lies. Not that we cannot or should not consider a medical school for Prince Edward Island. I believe we can not entirely sold on the fact that we should, but I believe we can and possibly should. <coughs> but I have grave concerns about whether we can or should do it now. Nobody has ever tried to establish a medical school in a small place in the midst of a health care system collapse. That has never been done before. <coughs> Indeed, we haven't built a new medical school in Canada for 20 years. And the licensing of this new school, the body which actually provides licenses to new medical schools has not met for 20 years. This is, a, this is some, and we are not the only one co contemplating uh, a new medical school at the moment. Of course, there are two or three others around the country. Um, <coughs> And I would say, when I think of the comparison of the school that we are contemplating here with the one in Cape Breton, for example, 
where the cost is estimated to be about a quarter of what ours is. Satellite campus, albeit, but but more importantly, the uh, <coughs> oh my, I apologise to everybody. Uh, the uh, new school c considered in Toronto, where they have done. If you go on the website for the the new school in Toronto, you will see extraordinary depths of uh, research. Budgets, financials, long-term plans, timelines associated with that. All things that I have yet to see with the medical school here on Prince Edward Island. <coughs> and <clears throat> again, my principal concern is that we do this in a way that does not negatively impact Islanders' already challenged access to primary care. And those are not just my concerns, those are concerns that I've heard repeatedly from many, many people. Suriel Myra, um, in, his, uh, in his seconding of the motion, talked about this being the actions of a, goal government, a, a bold government. <coughs> and you say that we are being bold, and I say that we are being, um, that we are unprepared. You say that whenever the medical school gets mentioned, hackles go up, I think was the phrase that you used. I would say that we are applying due diligence on an enormous project. You say that this is the action of a brave government. And I say you're blindly rushing ahead before we have shown to ourselves and to Islanders and to the University of Prince Edward Island that we are actually ready. You say that this is partisanship. And I say our actions are prudence, that we are looking at this in a way that is exactly the right thing to do for our jobs, which is to hold government to account and to make sure that Islanders' dollars, tax dollars, are being spent wisely and carefully and efficiently and effectively. There are so many unanswered questions regarding uh, this medical school. <coughs> How much will it cost? Well, we don't, know. We, don't what the, we don't know what the capital expense is going to be. We certainly don't know what the operational expense is going to be. We don't know where that funding is coming from. We know that there is input from the federal government. We know that the province has committed a certain amount. Presumably, the university will, will chip in some here. Uh, not at all. Will our current medical community be able to support the needs of this new medical school? That, again, is perhaps my fundamental and core concern. And it is because all of us, we, we all represent um, constituents, our island, islanders who live in our districts. <clears throat> and when I think back to the last election, just over a year ago, and when I think to the recent by-election in District 19, they were both dominated by the issue of health care. And with over 20% now of islanders not having access to a primary care physician, uh, that is something which impacts every single island family in one way or another, either directly or indirectly because of the knock-on effects, the domino effects of this lack of access. And we talk often in Canada about a two-tiered health system. And typically when we use that phrase, we are referring to private and public health care. And um, as many of us now know, that it's not such a neat, cleaved division. Um, there's a lot of fuzzy ground between uh, the public and, and private, um, private parts of health care. Uh, I'm in need of some primary health care right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, but the two-tiered health system that 
I'm talking about here is folks who have access to primary care and folks who do not have access to primary care. That's a real, very different life. And your, and your, uh, your um, involvement with the health system is very, very different if you have a primary caregiver or if you do not. And I'm very, very deeply concerned that the two-tier health system, which we have created, and we're not the only province with it, um, is something that we're going to exacerbate as we try to meet the needs of a new medical school in the midst of uh, a time when our health system is struggling and challenged to keep up even with the demands that come from islanders who are here now. And of course, that goes without talking at all about population growth and the, and the extra stresses that that has brought. So uh, a couple of folks who talked earlier talked about the, the issue of residency spots. <clears throat> and we know that the biggest determinant of where doctors actually practice, there are three things. There's where they have been brought up, where they're from, the medical school they go to, and by the way, whether that medical school is in their home province or somewhere else is actually a much lesser determinant. But the, the primary thing is where they spend their residency. And at the moment, we have a tiny number of residency spots, so we actually struggle each year to, uh, to make them work. We are increasing that to seven, and that's great. But when, we, when the medical school is up and running and we have full graduating classes just for three or four or five years from now, we are going to need upwards of 30, perhaps 40 residency spots. And the doctors who are providing mentorship to these residents takes about, I mean, there are many, many studies done on this, but it's about 20%, it takes about 20% of their working day in order to provide a residency spot for a new graduate, which is actually exactly the same amount of time that doctors uh, typically give to teaching in medical schools. So from our existing medical community here, we have to provide the school with somehow 20% of the time of a certain number of physicians. And we have to, at the same time, provide 30, 40 residency spots, which will demand 20% of the time of a number of other doctors. Or if they are the same ones, they are giving 40%, almost half of their working time up to working in the school or providing residency experiences for new graduates. And that's happening at a time when we are desperately short of doctors anyway. And if graduates go off island, as, uh, as O'Leary and Verness uh, suggested just a few moments ago, for, res for residency, um, the chances that we will get all of those students back are very small. A closer reader. OK, great. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, that was only five or six questions that I outstanding question, not outstanding. Those are, uh, those are uh, questions that have not been answered regarding the medical school. And I have many, many more. <clears throat> but when I, when I look at the motion before us here, I have some very specific concerns. Um, there are, some, there are some, some issues with the motion itself. And I'm going to, I have a few amendments here to make, Mr. Speaker. And I'll, produce, I'll present the first amendment today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I uh, adjourn debate seconded by the leader of the third party. The Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the member from Rustico Emerald, that this House now adjourn until Friday, April 19th at 10 a.m. Shall I carry? Carry. Have a good evening, everybody. Well, thank you, Minister.